Caught in the heart of a nuclear explosion. Victim of gamma radiation gone wild. Dr. Robert Bruce Banner now finds himself transformed in times of stress into seven feet, one thousand pounds of unfettered fury. The most powerful creature to ever walk the earth. The Incredible Hulk. This is Comic Geek Speak episode 1706. Spotlight on the Incredible Hulk in the Silver Age. Dr. Bruce Banner, melted by gamma rays, turns into the Hulk. Hulk. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm, I'm Adam Murdo. And I'm Chris Everly. <laughs> uh, a dramatic intro undermined a little bit by the <laughs> utter inanity of that theme song. Undermined? Come on. I've got to say, that Chris, a epic moment. I, I was saying to, to, to Brian earlier, this is <laughs> – it has a reputation for being the lamest of the uh, 60s uh, Grant Ray Lawrence <laughs> Marvel animated show intros. and I've, I've never actually heard it before now. Oh, and really? That, I, I think, didn't know that. Yeah, I've, I've really never seen an episode of any of those old shows. Uh, although I have heard the themes of a few, Spider-Man yeah. certainly, and Captain America. Of course, great of one. course. And uh, when we did the spotlight on Iron Man in the Silver Age, oh, I was introduced to the, the jazzy co- cocktail. The cool thing. as exec with the heart of steel. That, <laughs> he makes you feel. And, <laughs> and this just made me turn green. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Perfect. Well, <laughs> Mur- if if we ever do a Submariner spotlight, and I'd like to eventually, we can then unearth the Submariner theme from oh. the Grant Ray Lawrence hmm. cartoons. Yep. I have no idea what that sounds well, like. You can chalk it up to something you can look forward to. It's your <laughs> your geek bucket list of minutia. Mm. <laughs> My little cup overfloweth. <laughs> <sighs> But anyway, let's welcome everybody here to this. Welcome uh, indeed. Another one of our uh, uh, widely, uh, uh, hotly anticipated and widely adored series of uh, spotlights. You know, brought to you by uh, Professor of Comics History Chris Eberly, uh, with the, my co-chair Adam Murdo. Let's yeah, not forget. Well, yes, I'm just I'm the lowly TA this time around. I mean, it's <laughs> more lowly than usual because we were just comparing notes, and I've got not much to add to this episode. I'm I'm just Rick Jones in this jam session, Daddy O. <laughs> You dig it? <laughs> I'm also honored because uh, I realized uh, while I was preparing this, it's been nearly a year since I've helmed a spotlight. Has it really been that long? It's, last time was the Kirby ones last summer. Hmm. So it, it's good to get uh, to get back at, uh, sort of in the co-pilot chair for this. It's you know life's been tumultuous the past year, so it's good to be able to uh, squeeze one of these in. Hmm. I'm glad you were able to be here in person for it but too. You, you can't. You got to do a spotlight in person. It's it's absolutely essential. I do agree. Um, but now, before we go any further and get into the, the meat of our mighty Marvel matter here today, uh, we'd like to give a bit of a, a shout-out to the sponsors for this episode. Um, first of all, Superhero Stuff at SuperheroStuff.com, where you can go to buy all of your Superhero Stuff! stuff. <laughs> Perfect unison. Uh- <laughs> yes, they are an online source of uh, superhero and uh, otherwise geeky licensed apparel and uh, gear, tchotchkes, j- jewelry, uh, housewares, things like that. Uh, a specialty is superhero t-shirts and hats, but also hoodies, uh, watches, um, and other accessories, bed sheets. Uh, if you want a superhero pair of socks with capes on them, this is the place to go. I, I know of no other place to buy such a thing. <laughs> um, they're they're pretty well stocked with the Ant Man and the Wasp uh, merchandise right now. You can get a Pym Technologies T-shirt. You can get an Ant Man and the Wasp movie T-shirt. They're uh, they're displaying a uh, uh, like a little Funko Pop figurine of the movie version of the Ghost, uh, the Ava Star version of the Ghost, um, and one particular special offer that our friend Brian Pants Christman told us about. He was here just a, a few short moments ago, you know, just to commune with us before we began recording, and he told us that he got a message. I think this is something you need to be uh, uh, subscribed to their uh, e-newsletter to, to know about, but uh, uh, you're, you're getting this exclusive uh, leakage here on CGS. Uh, if you go to their their website, you can order pajama pants, uh, any two <laughs> pairs of uh, full-price twenty four ninety nine superhero pajama pants, and get a third for free if you use the uh, special bonus code PANTSME. 
This uh, amused Brian to no end, of course. I have no doubt. Yeah, and uh, there's over 40 different uh, styles of superhero pajama pants to choose from, so uh, you'll make the most of that. Um, so, yep, and uh, right now, 15% off orders of $45 or more with the code SAVEME15. So, SuperheroStuff.com, where you can buy all of your superhero, superhero stuff. stuff. Over 4,000 unique superhero items. Um, okay, and uh, also, this episode will be brought to us by the uh, Collection Drawer Company. Visit them at CollectionDrawer.com, where you can learn all about their uh, chief product, the Drawerbox Easy Access Storage Solution. Easy access because you get into a drawer box not by lifting off a flimsy cardboard lid, as with traditional long boxes, but by pulling an inner box out of an outer cardboard shell like a drawer. Particularly handy and convenient if you happen to have a large number of uh, traditional long boxes stacked up one on top of the other. You need to get something out of that bottom box on the pile. You have to lift all the other ones off and then remove that pesky lid, but not so if you've got collection drawers. Uh, if you've got a drawer box, uh, if your collection is housed in drawer boxes, you can just pull out that drawer and get at comics anywhere in your collection. No sweat. And uh, now, as within the past uh, year or so, they have uh, actually improved on their original design to make them three times as sturdy as they used to be so you can stack them up even higher and still not sacrifice any convenience. And let's not forget they also have available uh, certain box uh, drawer box accessories such as the Box Locks Anchors, which help to stabilize uh, your... Uh, boxes even better when they're stacked several high in a row, uh, and the box sort upright dividers, which help to uh, organize and protect your comics even better inside your drawer boxes. Uh, they are available in a variety of sizes and shapes if you want to apply this uh, peerless convenience to other large collections you may have and need to store. So if you need to store magazines or action figures or LP records, they've got uh, a drawer box of the proper dimensions for your needs. And if you need to replace a large number of existing boxes with drawer boxes, they do offer bulk discounts. So just stop by CollectionDrawer.com to find out how they can um, conveniently and affordably help you... Uh, revolutionize your collection at home. CollectionDrawer.com, home of the drawer box. Emmer, don't they have boxes also for um, things like action figures, records as well? Uh, yes, there is an action figure also. size. I think at some point they had a... Yeah, there's a sewing supply size as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just uh, head to CollectionDrawer.com and you can see all the different options available to you as a potential customer. It's a very handy-dandy product, and uh, each one of us here at CGS has made use of them at, at one time or another. Absolutely. All right, so that done? Murder, I want to point out, first of all, and knowing this is probably not uh, happenstance, you're wearing a green polo shirt. Yeah, you are absolutely right, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> this is not mere serendipity. This was forethought. I figured as much. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, today we're going to talk about Old Greenskin, <laughs> the Emerald Giant. Old J Jaws. J Jaws. All right, and go to the list of, uh, you know, loving Hulk nicknames. Uh, so I was thinking in the, in the spring, I was like, all right, it's been a long time since I've done a spotlight. I'd like to you know, start a new one. And as, as many listeners know, my specialty you know, tends to be the Marvel Universe and Marvel characters. And I realized – I think you guys in the first iteration of Spotlights did a Hulk one many years ago. It was – I came prepared this time yeah. since uh-huh. Pants is not here to tell us these things. Yeah. Episode 193. That was the first Hulk spotlight. But, of course, spotlight in those days meant something very different from what it does now. It was a spotlight on a character in those days was just whatever geeks happened to be present randomly reeling off the top Broad of their brush. heads. So, yeah, yeah. They're, they're favorite stories of that character across yeah. all ages of its history. Indeed. And uh, I decided, well, the Hulk is one of the major Marvel characters uh, we haven't addressed yet in this, this new format for the spotlight. Right. Uh, series and you know, he's obviously a major player in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Think about his role in Thor Ragnarok. Uh, last year, I thought it was high time to uh, give the character at least a Silver Age uh, era its due. So, Myrna and I have made the trek to the studio uh, in honor again of old Jay Jaws. And, <laughs> Quite uh, a few miles traveled between the two of us, yes, too, since we were I, both in New Jersey as of this morning. Yes, and sir, I'm honored that, uh, that you've joined us. Oh, the honor me. is all mine. Thank Chris. you. Thank you. And I also wanted to point out before we plunge in, uh, once again, thank you to the listeners and, as well, and our sponsors who have been donating so generously in the past several months uh, to the show. It's really appreciated. Uh, again, anyone who wants to donate any any amount, uh, we really appreciate that because it just helps us uh, maintain the show and uh, keep it going. So, again, thanks to all for that. Now, as many long-term listeners know, we're going to plunge in here with a, a full review of the Hulk's uh, – Publication history in, in the Silver Age, which is of course the 1960s. Uh, we're going to take it from uh, his first appearance in Hulk number one 
cover date, Incredible Hulk number one, I should say, cover date May 1962. Uh, and for the purpose of this episode, I decided to take it all the way to what many people consider the cutoff for the Silver Age is when Marvel switched to 15 cent covers. Oh, ho. Now, some people, th- there's different definitions of the Bronze Age versus the Silver Age. Some would say the Bronze Age starts with the 1970s. Some people think it starts, you know, sort of with the death of Gwen Stacy. Um, others think it's the 15 cent covers. Uh, admittedly, I, you know, pulling back the curtain here, I, I chose the 15 cent covers because the last issue we're going to talk about in our checklist is Incredible Hulk 118, which is a longstanding favorite of mine. It's, it's a, a Donnie Brook with the Submariner, and it's one of the first Hulk comics I've read because it's reprinted in Origin of Marvel Comics. That's the last issue we're we'll looking at. Um, and that's from uh, 1969, so right on the sort of the cusp of the Silver Age uh, into the Bronze. So I had wondered what inspired that as the uh, yeah ending it's point. Pure, for today's pure nostalgia, my friend. Uh, couched in the the 15 cent uh, cover interpretation of that of that boundary. Um, of course, though, we're going to start with our first impressions of the character. When we think about the Incredible Hulk. What does it make us harken back to it in our own lives? Murd. Please hold forth. Ah, well, I actually have a definite answer for this oh, one, Chris, um, because I, I know exactly when I first heard of the Hulk. Uh, and it still summons up uh, memories of early life terror for me. Because oh, uh, okay. I don't know if you, you may or may not remember this, Chris, but there was for one season in the early 1980s an Incredible Hulk cartoon show. Oh, yes, vividly. Yeah, that was uh, – I think NBC combined it with uh, Spider-Man they and his did. amazing friends yep. for a block for a, a year or two. And uh, this would have been 1982-83, and uh, it was a Marvel production series. Yep. And I was – in 82 and 83, I was three and four years old respectively. But uh, some, I, I did uh, somehow on Saturday morning get exposed to one of the episodes of that, of that Hulk cartoon. I think that was about the only one I ever saw because I was – too afraid of the main character to try watching it again after that. <laughs> it, it was the one with the puppet master in it. Uh-huh. I remember the Hulk was – the puppet master put some kind of little yellow headband on the Hulk's head with a little antenna sticking up out of it, which gave him for a time control over the Hulk's movements. I remember the Hulk saying, Hulk, help no one except puppet master. <laughs> It was Bob Holt doing that voice, as I just learned yesterday, okay. looking, this up, looking all of this up on Wikipedia. Um, but yeah, that, I remember that, and I remember also probably uh, General Ross saying, Bruce Banner is the Hulk, <laughs> because that was also the episode where that, that, that became known ah. to his military pursuers. So kind of a key episode in that uh, brief one-season show. Um, but I remember near the end of the episode when the Hulk kind of – broke free of the Puppet Master's control. You could see that little yellow beanie that had been put on his head falling off and blowing away amidst the rubble he was creating. And just a terrifying force of nature, he seemed to me. And I remember thinking, oh, <laughs> oh, good, the Hulk is no longer under the control of the Puppet Master. Oh, no, the Hulk is no longer under the control of anyone. <laughs> I'm not sure what terrified me more, this incredibly powerful green brute being under the control of an evil man or being left under his own uh, – to, to his own cognizance to rampage and destroy wantonly and randomly. But he, he he really did scare the living stuffing out of me as a young child. You know, He had the effect that I, guess, I think Stan Lee intended for this character to have. Um, but he, he didn't get very many opportunities for the Hulk to genuinely scare people because – you know, his his readers were a little older. They had the, the advantages of irony and distance. I think of uh, an issue of Alan Moore's Promethea where the, the main character encounters the big bad wolf mm. of legend and fable in the uh, the immateria, the realm of pure concepts, and uh, how she was terrified by him because she was forced to see him through the eyes of a child without the benefit of irony or distance. And that I can still remember being able to see the Hulk that way. And it's still it, – it's it was terrifying, but as most things that scare us as young children do, it also pr- provokes a bit of a thrill when you encounter mm. them again as, as a, an older child or an adult. And uh, so seeing the Incredible Hulk breaking free of the Puppet Master on that silly cartoon all those years ago still kind of it, – it's still loose and stomping around in the back of my imagination every time I see a comic or any other image of the Hulk to this day. Murd, I hope this episode's not going to traumatize you. No, I, I think we're safe. <laughs> the only piece of entertainment that truly traumatized me in my childhood is Disney's Pinocchio, but that's an entirely different topic. That we shall not touch here. Much appreciated. Indeed. Uh, it's funny you mention that, that cartoon because I've watched that uh, 
diligently as a kid because uh, I was a little bit older than you. Mm-hmm. So I loved it, and you're correct. It, it was often partnered with Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And two memories I have of that. One, I remember the episode. The one episode I was especially thrilled by because they introduced Hydra. Mm-hmm. And it's the first time I ever saw Hydra agents actually animated because I was reading all the the old Nick Fury stories then. So that really thrilled me. And I remember in the classic Michael Keaton film, Mr. Mom, <laughs> when he's leaving for work in the beginning, the kids, his kids are watching an episode from that uh, Hulk cartoon. Um, my first impressions of the Hulk, Hulk, uh, G- Hulk, the Hulk go back a little bit earlier just because of our age difference. Um I was born in 1973, so I was old enough to watch and remember the Incredible Hulk television show mm. live action with Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno. No, I never saw that myself, but Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood did a series of episodes in 1979 because Mr. Rogers anticipated uh, you know, fragile kids like me being a little freaked out by the transformation from Bixby to Ferrigno on that show. So he made it a point to bring Bixby and Ferrigno on his show to oh, explain to that. children that there was nothing to be afraid of. Yet he, he did a whole week's themed shows on superheroes, but particularly the Hulk. Oh, so that's, I can add that to my earlier. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is why... Adam Murdo is such a vital member of the CGS Legion. Oh, come oh. on. I can name drop Mr. Rogers every <laughs> no, once in a while. I, that's a wonderful chest. <laughs> if I, if I accomplish it. no more than that, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I watched the show. And, then, and you, you may recall they did a series of specials after the series ended. You may have seen some of those. Yes, the TV movies. Yeah. There was one that had Thor in it and oh, the they Trial sure of the Hulk with yeah. Daredevil. With yeah. Daredevil, yeah. Not the Thor or the Daredevil as we would think about them, but mm. they were there. <laughs> Um, in some form. Yes. But uh, I love the show when I was a kid, the, the mournful theme music, uh, you know, the wild-eyed reporter who no one will believe uh, tra- trying to track the Hulk down. Um, and that was one of my first exposures to the character. Uh, and I, I, that's still a great show. I think it was, it was very well done for its time. But I also I, I was also exposed to it again, and I go back to this well. Every time we discuss these, these early origins of our love of Marvel characters was the Power Records. I got a power record. I think it was Herb Trimpey art, and they reprinted a, a story from beyond the, the scope of this episode. It was later in the 70s, but it was the Hulk fighting I, both the Abomination and the Rhino. <laughs> <laughs> so that – I love that. Plus, you know, it, it, he was on Gamma Base and the Soldiers. So, you know, I, 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 I'm, I mean, I'm under 10 years old, so that thrilled me. And, you know, the I love the Herb Trimpey art, and I didn't know who he was yet. And then th- – also, my incredible – my Marvel Superheroes Metal Lunchbox, which has the Hulk on it, and of course, always goes back to Origin of Marvel Comics, which again was given to me by now forgotten family friends when I was a kid, uh, and I was just riveted by that, that origin story. And then, of course, the Hulk's battle with the Submariner, again, Herb Trimpey art in issue 118, which we'll talk about uh, later on in the episode. But again, as I as I began to grow up a bit and start to read more and more comics, I began to appreciate the, the the role of the Hulk, his place in the Marvel universe, and of the great complexity of the character. Uh, I mean, when I was really coming of age as a comic reader in the 1980s, you know, I was exposed to the Peter David run on Hulk with with, the, or with Todd McFarlane and beyond, and that was obviously a far more sophisticated and, and uh, complex story than what I was accustomed to. When I would have been reading when I was much younger, and also I was just older, had a, a more sophisticated sensibility as a reader. So that that reminds me, as we get into the, the Hulk's origin, we have to we should note here, and I'm sure Murd will concur, the Hulk has been heavily retconned when it comes to his origin and uh, sort of his his, his upbringing and, and all of that. A lot of what we're going to talk about here is not to be found in the Silver Age. Mm. Uh, it, it's introduced a lot of it's introduced by Peter David. Uh, much later on, but it's very pertinent to the Hulk's uh, origin. So uh, bear that in mind, my faithful listeners, as we uh, move forward here. So any other initial thoughts you want to share, brother? Uh, well, just one more. Please. Look, just, just, just tie things back to Pinocchio. Another yeah. reason why <laughs> I found the Hulk so terrifying was not just because he was this hugely powerful force of nature, but because uh, he was – a human being underneath uh, who just uh, found himself uncontrollably transformed into this horrible inhuman thing periodically. And uh, I had a strong sense of existential terror at an abnormally young (laughs) age. So I was almost as terrified by that as I was by the prospect of being turned into a donkey if I misbehaved. So that's – that. there's your Pinocchio connection. So I want (sighs) the listeners to appreciate – I want the listeners to appreciate – 
Merge bravery when it comes to this episode. He, fit, ladies and gentlemen, he's, he's unearthing and facing some childhood demons here. He's doing it all for you. <laughs> please, please bear that in mind and give the man some props. Thanks for holding my hand through this, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I also forgot, I almost forgot to mention, uh, going back to our introduction, I also loved, of course, the Grant Ray Lawrence Hulk cartoon, which with that wonderfully abysmal theme song. Because <laughs> um, when I was a kid in the late 70s, early 80s, they were playing those cartoons on, I think it was WPIX Channel 11. Every afternoon after school, and that those those each character's installment was very brief. I don't I remember maybe it was seven minutes, something like that. So they they play a block of them uh, when I was watching them. That's also one of my earliest exposures to the character, and I, I'm sure many listeners have seen those cartoons. That's a whole another discussion in itself. We'll talk about it a little bit at the end of the episode as well. But um, let's just say the. There's not much when it comes to the word animation when it comes to those <laughs> uh, cartoons. So we'll talk about a little bit more uh, near the end. But all these are all the elements that, that made me acquainted uh, with this, uh, of course, legendary character. Um, all right. Let's, let's ready to plunge in, brother? Absolutely. All right. So let's start a bit with just some sort of introductory material in terms of publication and so forth. So again, uh, The Incredible Hulk first appears in Incredible Hulk number one. Uh, the cover date is May 1962. So that's a, he probably came out, I'd say, maybe February of that year. What do you think? About a, was it about a two-month gap? I always forget. <sighs> at, at different times, it's been a two- yeah. or a three-month yeah. lag. So we'll say January February of 1962 uh, was when he hit the newsstands. Uh, of course, it's a Lee Kirby uh, production. This, this is the second Marvel hero to appear since the Fantastic Four. So it, it goes the FF, and then I believe it's the Hulk who comes after them. So – Oh, Spider-Man in there, too. Oh, Amazing Fantasy 15. Yeah, that's right. That's, he's also in the 1962. That's correct. Thank you, Murray. All right, but uh, I guess this is the second uh, Marvel character to debut in issue number one of his own comic. Yes. Uh, the script is Stan Lee. Pencils Jack Kirby. Inks is Paul Reinman. Uh, letters Artie Simic. Now, a couple things I have to mention right off the bat, and I'm sure many listeners are familiar with this. The first appearance of the Hulk, his hide is colored gray, not green. And... Stanley felt uh, that that would be a, a very menacing uh, visage for the character. Mm. But when the book came back for the printers, he was dismayed to see that they couldn't maintain the consistency of that gray tone uh, from panel to panel and uh, with, with the technology they had at that time. And that's why in the second issue, the Hulk appears as green. Just, just a little, little, a little uh, tidbit there. Of course, as many people know, when we get to the 1980s and 90s, they bring the Gray Hulk back, and by then they're be able to more easily maintain the consistency of the the gray tone to the the character's height. There's a whole retcon on what the Gray Hulk was supposed to mean versus the Green Hulk, uh, which we'll talk about. Issue one is also the first appearances of this glorious roll call of leading and supporting characters. Of course, Robert Bruce Banner, usually known as Bruce Banner, sometimes as Bob, thanks to Stan's memory, as we'll That's see. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Hulk's faithful sidekick, uh, Rick Jones, becomes a pretty key character in the Marvel Universe all on his own. He's not just going to be confined to the Hulk as his character progresses. Uh, Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, the uh, I believe it's Air Force general, who uh, he sort of becomes sort of like the Captain Ahab uh, to the Incredible Hulk, and uh, his whole life going forward is, is pretty much consumed with trying uh, to bring the Hulk. Uh, into captivity, and of course, a lot of this is tied. This fixation is also tied into the fact that his daughter Betty Ross uh, will develop a romantic relationship, in many ways, a tragic relationship with Bruce Banner, and, and not in these initial issues, but eventually, people will, will find out that Banner is the Hulk. So that's going to also add a complication uh, to that dynamic. So, do you want any, any opening thoughts you have on the, that first issue, Murd? Uh, not so far. Yeah. Okay. We, we should mention here that. Marvel going into this era, so coming out of the 1950s and early 60s, a lot of what Marvel was doing, and, and they weren't called Marvel at this point in the 50s. They were – if they had a name, it was Atlas Comics. Um, remember in the, in the 30s and 40s, often called Timely. Uh, that kind of morphed into Atlas. But again, Martin Goodman, the publisher, his larger company, Magazine Management, had a variety of subdivisions. Men, what they were all called Men's Sweat Magazines, uh, <laughs> Puzzle Books. And comics were part of that. Um, but one of the big things that they were doing comics in the, in the Marvel office at that time, and the Marvel office was basically just Stan Lee essentially, was uh, monster books. We talked about this in previous episodes, especially Lee working with Kirby and Ditko. Uh, fin Fan Foom was the most famous. 
you know, I'm always a big fan of Sprague, the Living Hill. Uh, <laughs> was it Umba? I don't know. I, I always forget. I'm sure there was. Yeah. <laughs> there was a Timbuba. That's what I'm thinking of. Uh, maybe Gormu. I don't know. There's all these different absurd. Uh, Gratu, King Gratu. of the Ants. Yep. Fun, fun monsters. And both Benjamin J. Grimm, the thing, and the, and the Incredible Hulk really come out of that tradition. So both those characters are kind of a transitional bridge from Marvel's sort of you know, monster heyday into sort of the Marvel age of comics, the, 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 the classic Marvel Universe uh, character. I'm going to read a quote here from uh, Stan Lee on the Hulk's creation. Uh, this is from Origin of Marvel Comics. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for the Frankenstein monster. No one ever could, could ever convince me that he was the bad guy, the villain or the menace. It was he who was sinned against by those who feared him, by those whose first instinct was to strike out blindly at whatever they couldn't comprehend. He never wanted to hurt anyone. He only groped his torturous way through a second life, trying to defend himself, trying to come to terms with those who sought to destroy him. I suppose you can guess where we're heading. Think of the challenge would be to make a hero out of a monster. We'd have a protagonist with superhuman strength, but he wouldn't be all wise, all noble, all infallible. We use the concept of the Frankenstein monster, but update it. Our hero would be a scientist, transformed into a raging behemoth by a nuclear accident. Again, again, the radiation was the go-to cause for the, a lot of these things back then. <laughs> and since so I was willing to borrow from Frankenstein, I decided I might as well borrow from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as mm. well. Our protagonist would constantly change from his normal identity to a superhuman alter ego and back again. Now, we always have to give this caveat. We discussed this history. This is a Lee Kirby co-creation. So there's always a dispute and controversy about who was actually more involved in the creation of, of these particular well, these particular characters. Uh, you, you speak to – well, Jack Kirby, of course, is, is, is past. But if you look, go back to the uh, uh, quotes, which we'll get to the, some from Kirby in a moment, there's different points of view. Again, we're talking about events that occurred you know, well over 50 years ago. So memory can become an issue. Um, and, of course, you, know, you also had the – the unequal power sharing because, you know, Stanley was the editor. Jack Kirby was the freelance uh, artist. The, both men, uh, the men worked very closely together. As always, I always, I always just come back, come down to saying these are co-creations. Um, and again, because of the Marvel method, which we talked about many times before, in case readers, listeners aren't aware, Stanley was so overworked because he was art director, editor in chief, and the main scripter. He didn't have the time to write out detailed plots for a lot of these stories and because he had such confidence in the legendary galaxy of, of artists working for him, you know, Lee Ditko, excuse me, Kirby Ditko, Dick Ayers, uh, you know, later John Buscema, John Romita Sr., Gil Kane, you know, your heart should be palpitating as you hear these names. It goes on and on. He would say, all right, you know, this issue I want the FF to battle Dr. Doom. Go. And he maybe give him a couple, a couple plot points and that the artist would – Draw out the entire issue, and then Lee would go back. He might make some adjustments as editor, and then he would put in the word balloons and, and the uh, captions, and then off the book would go to the printer. So, of course, as these characters became these, in some cases, multi billion dollar properties, now through the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there's the, the growing uh, controversy, well, it's not growing, it's been around now for quite some time, about the issue of credit. So, that applies to the Hulk as it applies to any of these other characters. In fact, I remember an anecdote from our Kirby spotlights when Kirby was, was, had, was talking about when he got into a toy store with his grandchild and he saw his Hulk art on, on a toy and actually got almost physically ill and he was so angry because um, you know, he wasn't being given credit, which, I th- which from what I read was, was in many ways what was most important to him as, More well, so than yeah, the compensation. as financial compensation. Now, of course, when you look at Marvel Comics today, any, anything that involves a co- Kirby co-creation, they all say now – Created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, which we assume comes out of the the suit that was settled just a few years ago between the Kirby estate and, uh, well, Marvel and Disney now at this point. So, if I remember last summer, Murd, I was vacationing uh, with family in Seattle, and, and I saw online the Disney had their Legends ceremony where they acknowledged certain people who have had a massive impact on on popular culture, sort of through the the Disney uh, company. And they, they honored both Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. So it's unfortunate that he's not living to see it, but Kirby is really finally getting his due uh, as the co-creator. Let's, let, and let's talk about uh, Kirby's view on the Hulk. And I got these quotes from uh, – have you ever seen this book, Murr? It's a great book. The Silver Age of Comic Book Art by Arlen Schumer. 
Uh, is that a kitchen sink logo I see down at the bottom? Uh, just says Collector's Press. Oh, okay. But uh, this is a great book. Uh, he goes chock full of wonderful illustrations. Arlen Schumer is an artist and, and a graphic designer. And he, he gives you sort of his take on key Silver Age artists. And this is the section on Kirby. I'll read a couple quotes. I created the Hulk, and I saw him as a kind of handsome Frankenstein. I never felt the Hulk was a monster because I felt the Hulk was me. I feel all the characters were me. And here's another quote. Now, what, what, what I, I should preface this reading by saying, ladies and gentlemen, Jack Kirby was renowned for being a great storyteller and sometimes being exaggerating. So I, I don't know if what he's saying here actually happened, but I'm sure in his mind it did. The Hulk I created when I saw a woman lift a car. Her baby was caught underneath the running board. His mother was horrified, and this woman in desperation lifted the rear end of the car. It suddenly came to me that in desperation we can all do that. We can knock down walls. We can go berserk. Can t- you can tear a house down. I created a character who did all that and called him the Hulk. So that's, that's the old, like, someone's filled with adrenaline because of a, a crisis moment. They can, you know, call upon strength that they didn't realize they had. Mm-hmm. Maybe so. And uh, one other interesting quote from, from Kirby He's here he's talking about working on the monster comics of the 50s. It was a challenge to try to do anything with such ridiculous characters. But these were, in a way, the forefathers of the Marvel heroes. We had a thing. We had a Hulk. We tried to do them in a more exciting way. So, again, he's, he's acknowledging, as I've seen Lee acknowledge in other interviews, the, 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 the ties to those, those fun, you know, absurdist and fun monster comics of the uh, 1950s. There's thing else I found interesting here in this book, Murd. Do you remember the Aurora Monster Model Kits? I remember seeing ads for them yeah, in the comics. Yeah, we obviously weren't alive when they came out, but they were enormously popular. And according to Schumer, uh, the Frankenstein model, model kit, plastic model kit, was, was one of the huge uh, toy sellers of 1961. And supposedly Martin, Goodman, Martin, Goober, Martin Goodman said <laughs> he wanted the Hulk to be a, quote, super Frankenstein. And go back to what Lee just said in the, in the quote I read earlier – Obviously, these were you know Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, Frankenstein's monster, mm-hmm. all had an impact right. on the creation of this character, and the dozens of Cold War era Atlas comics, uh, Atomic Age monsters that uh, Lee Kirby and Ditko would put together. And we should acknowledge there as well, excellent that again, radiation is the go-to catalyst for the origins of a lot of these characters. You know, because it's it's very much the Cold War, uh, the Atomic Age, uh, 1962 is when you know the Cuban Missile Crisis occurs. So the space race is going for the United States and the Soviet Union. There's a lot of, you know, concern about the effects of radiation. I remember the classic uh, 50s horror film, Them, mm. when the ants are mutated into these enormous, uh, you know, creatures who are uh, attacking people. And I, I remember as a kid watching that on Saturday morning and, like, the soldier trying to kill them with flamethrowers and so forth, um, whatever the huge cardboard ants were or whatever. But um, – <laughs> So that, that was very much in the zeitgeist. If I read a couple quotes here from uh, two uh, highly renowned comic book historians. First, Les Daniels. The Hulk became Marvel's most disturbing embodiment of the perils inherent in the atomic age. And the great Peter Sanderson. Ultimately, the classic version of the Hulk is a human being reduced to his essence in a tragic world. A lonely individual who longs for peace, but rages against the forces arrayed against him and bravely fights back. So you have to remember, the Hulk despite his immense strength and power, is often portrayed as this very tragic underdog-type figure who is being hounded, misunderstood, often just wants to be, you know, wants peace, wants solace, wants to be left alone. And, you know, Lee talked about that in the quote I just read uh, a few minutes ago. That's one of the the running themes throughout, I think, the Hulk's publishing history. He's often being pursued, the army, the police, uh, or wants to be, various villains want to manipulate him to their own ends. All he really wants to do is jump off into the desert and uh, sulk by himself and be yep. left alone. Exactly. I mean we can think of many images from the comic book where they have the Hulk sitting next to a stream, a lake, in a forest, or in the desert, as you said, you know, just in his own, in his own mind just sort of relishing that, that, that solitude. So that's something to bear in mind uh, as well. Any comments before I move on? Um, well, if it's not too presumptuous of me Never, to sir. interject myself into august company like Daniels and Sanders Please and Lee do. and Kirby, I actually had a couple of encapsulated uh, oh, terrific. descriptions of the Hulk written down that I will now recite. 
this is my, my own master of arts, pseudo scholarly <laughs> perspective here. The Hulk could be described as the dark id driven underside of the scientific mind. The personification of the cognitive dissonance and even the self-loathing produced when rational, benevolent, creative faculties of science are built to a childishly irrational, destructive pursuit like warfare. The abused, traumatized foster child of the military-industrial complex, lashing out as a monster at the world he failed as a scientist, for which neither that world nor the military-industrial complex will ever forgive him. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Murdo's office hours have been posted. He is now available <laughs> for, to review your term papers. I'm Mur- sitting there playing solitaire until somebody <laughs> arrives. <laughs> Murdo, that was magnificent. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Just a couple of thoughts. No, it, it, it's well said because you use the, use the phrase military-industrial complex, which is also very important here because you know Eisenhower gives that famous speech as he's leaving office in the early 60s. And that, that was very much on people's mind. In fact, it, one could argue it's still very much a, a facet of, of, of the American experience that you know, the, the, the economic and ideological and technological power and presence of, of that military-industrial uh, complex. And the Hulk is definitely – I mean the gamma bomb, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and a lot of the early Marvel comics, we talked about how – I remember in our, our, our Thor Silver Age spotlight in one issue, he was helping the, the, the government test a new bomb. Uh, Tony Stark was originally an arms manufacturer that, that – you know, Cold War, Daring Do, Playboy, uh, Bruce Banner, the brilliant nuclear physicist, is is trying to help the government develop a new weapon. So it's all part and parcel of that. Bravo, Murd. Bravo. All right, the Hulk's publication. Just, just, just you know, we're we'll covering here. So, Incredible Hulk, Volume One, only ran for six issues, nineteen sixty two to nineteen sixty three. So apparently, it didn't sell well enough to suit uh, Martin Goodman's expectations. So it was canceled, but Lee must have realized he had something because he very quickly put the Hulk in other books. He'll appear in, issue, in Avengers issues 1 through 3 and issue 5, Fantastic Four 25 uh, and 26, Amazing Spider-Man 14, which is also the first appearance of the Green Goblin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Tales to Astonish issue 60, that's where he gets he's – put, he's put into that book, and that's where he, that's where he finds a home in, beginning in 1964. Uh, he'll co-star in that book with who, Murd? Oh, uh, Giant Man and the Wasp, yep. and later Namor the Submariner. That's correct. So we have to remember that Marvel – we mentioned this in previous episodes. Goodman had lost his distributor because of a, an ill-advised business decision in the 50s, and he had to go hat in hand to uh, Independent News, the distribution arm of DC Comics, Harry Donafell, Jack Leibowitz, and ask them to – Distribute his books, and they said, okay, you can distribute eight titles a month because Goodman was notorious for flooding the market with sort of like knockoffs of what was ever popular at that moment. So if it's Cowboys and Indians, it's, we're going to do ten of those. Crime, war, what have you, romance, etc. So DC clearly wanted to kind of keep Goodman under their thumb, and one way he got around this was to have these house titles, Tales to Astonish, Tales of Suspense, Journey into Mystery, Strange Tales – where they put two characters in the book. So they'd have, they'd have shorter stories, essentially. And then uh, in 1968, uh, Marvel is able to break free from that distribution uh, sort of prison they were in, and they're able to expand, and the Hulk then gets his own title. So as is often the tradition, they would not restart numbering whatever book he was in, which in this case was Tales to Astonish, with issue 102 it became The Incredible Hulk. And that's 1968. So that's, those, that's the uh, publications we're going to be looking at here. And what I thought to be interested in this, I was, I'm always interested by the prototype concept. Um, a lot of the Marvel characters, either whether it's on purpose or not, Lee and his artists would sort of try them out or borrow from earlier concepts. And then that sort of form of the foundation. So – we talked about how I think it was Doctor Strange had a prototype. Was it Doctor Droom? Mm-hmm. Later, Doctor Druid. Yeah, right, exactly. That's one. That's one good example. Um, before they brought Captain America back in the Silver Age, they had him that villain dress up yes, as him. the Acrobat. I believe. Yeah, I think it was a Strange Tales issue with the Human Torch. It was. So, and the Hulk is even more the case because again, the Hulk comes out of that monster tradition. So, I, I looked up a couple of prototypes here. So, Strange Tales seventy five nineteen sixty. There's a robot called the Hulk. Uh, it's armor worn by Al- a character named Albert Poole. 
Now, when they re- did reprints of this, they changed the character's name to Grutan. <laughs> seems like a perfectly logical step from <laughs> Hulk to Grutan. Sure. <laughs> Journey into Mystery 19... 19- Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Didn't mean that for that eruptation there to get on the air. <laughs> Journey of Mystery, issue 62, also 1960. Zemnu the Living. Okay, uh, the Living Hulk, he's called. Mm-hmm. Drawn by Kirby. He was a furry, huge alien. So that looks nothing like the Hulk we know, but they were using the word Hulk there again. Now, Go of, ahead, Murd. Of the three proto-Hulks you've got here, Chris, this is the only one that I've actually heard of. I figured. Because uh, Zemnu you know, had... had uh, Kind of a longer life after the introduction of the Bruce Banner Hulk than the other two did. He's, he's, he's appeared since. Yes, yes, a few times. Uh, I believe Steve Gerber used him in The Defenders. Of course. <laughs> and uh, John Byrne brought him back because it was just silly enough to be good for his She-Hulk run. So he, he was yeah, – they, they reprinted his early – he actually appeared twice in Journey into Mystery in number 62 and then The Return of the Living Hulk. Uh, that was in number 66. Um, but when they reprinted his early appearances, they uh, changed his name to Zemnu the Titan. Ah, and uh, so this big white shaggy creature walked the Marvel Universe Earth again through the seventies and eighties. He's one of the kind of a, a silly artifact of the, of the Bronze Age, uh, but uh, he had his roots, of course, back in nineteen sixty. The say. Great Merdini, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Tales to Astonish twenty one in nineteen sixty one. There's just an orange, orange again, orange slimy monster, just called the Hulk. In reprints, they changed the name to the Glop. So that goes back to the whole heap pedigree of, mm-hmm. of uh, muck monsters, so to speak. Yeah, and the Hulk, the, the Bruce Banner Hulk would encounter one very much like that, uh, well, just beyond the pale of what we're going to be talking about here in the very early Bronze Age. What, what's the character's name? The Glob. Oh, I remember that cover. Yes. Yeah, that's, I actually – I own that issue. It's, I think it was the first one that Roy Thomas wrote when he took over as a scribe. Well done, sir. Yeah, that, that's just in the cusp where we'll be stopping. That's true. Yep. All right, now uh, let's take a look at, at uh, the Hulk's origin. Again, as, just as a caveat, a lot of this is retconned because a lot of what we're going to be talking about here is now well established as part of the Hulk's canon. But in these early issues, none of the lead hasn't thought of any of this stuff yet. A lot of this is from Peter David, actually, but it's all part of the Hulk's official origin today. Um, so Robert Bruce Banner is the son of Dr. Brian Banner, who is an atomic physicist, and uh, Rebecca Banner, and – Brian Banner was a raging alcoholic. Uh, he was abusive both to uh, his son and his wife, and he, he murdered his wife uh, in a rage. And uh, in fact, when you think about the Ang Lee film, The Hulk, in the 2000s, remember Nick Nolte plays the father, and, and, and Lee really, Ang Lee really gets into that dynamic. Remember this? You've seen the movie, right? Uh, it's a long, been a long it's time. Me too, but, yes. but there's a scene at the end where they're kind of like strapped down and, and chairs, and they're streaming each other and so forth. So they've got a lot of mileage out of this in later years. It's, it's not present at all in these early stories that we're going to be talking about. But they, they, I think they wanted to establish that it wasn't just the gamma radiation. There was something within Bruce Banner himself, his own childhood trauma, that combined with the gamma radiation was the catalyst for this rage beast coming out of him. Right. I think his father taught him to fear his own anger Yeah, and pushed it inside. And Banner, again, was very repressed. Even these early issues, like emotionally, he's not like a very outgoing, you know, he's not Tony Stark jazzy with the cocktail in his hand <laughs> by any stretch. Um, now, Banner is became... The leading nuclear physicist of the Marvel Universe. He's off. I've read some articles. They say he's like quote the fourth smartest person in the Marvel Universe. I'm guessing one is Reed, probably two is Doom, three is Tony Stark. I think something like that. Now we have to make to find where Lunella Lafayette, Moon Girl, fits within all of that because she's supposedly ah yes, newly introduced uh, upper echelon of Marvel intellectual elite and T'Challa's way up there uh, as well. Now, go ahead, Burns. Go no, ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. So, what's interesting here is that again, you know, when, when they're creating a character, uh, you know, that process is is ongoing. So initially, again, going back to Lee's comment about Jekyll and Hyde, in the first issue, the Hulk's change occurs at sunset. Every sunset, he becomes the Hulk. Uh, but they eventually morph that into the catalyst is not, you know, the turning of the er- turning of the earth. It is. Whenever he feels intense anger, stress, uh, frustration, excitement, that uh, sparks the change. Can you identify a specific uh, turnover point when the trigger was changed from – I don't – that I didn't – look. I must admit, sir, I, I failed you there. 
I don't know the exact issue where they kind of make that transition. They probably didn't call attention to it when they did either. Very likely, but and I'm sure some of the forums, Mr. Wellington can help us with that. <laughs> um, but uh, it's like it's like a lot of creative uh, endeavors. As if when something again, the creators probably didn't realize how long these characters were going to last, the imprint they were going to make. So things morph over time. Also, I, I, from the reading I've done, again, classic retcon in the original Sin storyline from a couple of years back, uh, which Jason Aaron helmed, uh, revealed that Tony Stark actually had modified and refined the Gamma Bomb, which they now say is explanation as to why Bruce actually survived the explosion. So, again, in the retconning origin, Bruce and Tony met, I forgot if it was Harvard somewhere, they met at a college when they were younger, so there, there's a history between them uh, as well, so that's just the, that's, the, that's just the the sort of the building blocks there uh, of of Bruce's origin. Now, the Hulk's powers are extensive. <laughs> you often hear the the tagline "the strongest one there is," and again, they always say the anger the angry the Hulk gets, the stronger he gets. And I, I remember the classic. Remember the original Secret Wars miniseries. Where they're all trapped under the mountain. Oh, yes. The classic cover image. Yes. And the only thing holding up the mountain is the Hulk. And Reed actually goads the Hulk into getting angrier. So he'll actually throw like, this entire mountain off the hero so they can all survive. So and I remember the, the image like sweat streaming down his face. He's getting more and more enraged as, as Reed is goading him. And this is while Bruce Banner's mind was in the Hulk's body too. Just, it's just a little peculiarity of the lineup of the – And, and, and Murd, I'm gl- – well done. Damn, outstanding. I'm glad you mentioned that because we should also point out that – and they've experimented this from the early Silver Age days of the Hulk. Sort of the classic stereotype of the Hulk is like, you know, Hulk smash, puny humans, right? Uh, you know, and he's like sort of like the childlike uh, right. expressions of demeanor. He's not always like that though. In fact, in the first appearance of the Hulk, he's more of like the Mr. Hyde type. Right. Persona. For a while there, he could speak in complete sentences. Yes. He was a little surly and laconic, but uh, he still right. he wasn't reverting to brutish, uh, fractured sentences. Yeah, and, and, but as we get as we get further in the Silver Age, then you, you have that image of the Hulk that most people are familiar with when they think of the Hulk. But in the 1980s, there was an extensive period and, and beyond with, with Peter David where Banner was had control of the Hulk's body. Um, so we have to bear that uh, in mind as well. Now, so... The Hulk's strength is essentially limitless. I mean, they, there's no real gauge of how strong he actually is because the anger he gets, the more the, the you know, the more he can bench, so to speak. Um, you know, a mountain. His stamina, his durability, his healing. Um, based when he feels intense stress or excitement or anger, it unleashes this just colossal adrenaline surge in in his system. Um, and again, they've established the retcon. The transformation may also be tied as a mental trigger to his childhood trauma. You know, his, his father was a monstrous figure right. in his upbringing, mm-hmm. and that 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 they feel today that that's deeply tied in. Like that's mm-hmm. that that psyche is very much a part right. of all this. It's long been theorized that the Hulk is not some dark side of, of Banner's psyche, really, but it's just his uh, wounded, repressed inner child. Yes, coming out and trying to defend itself, which would then tie into that that more childlike Hulk that people are often uh, you know familiar with. Exactly. Uh, so if you try if you try to attack Bruce Banner. <laughs> Chances are the Hulk is going to appear, and uh, you're going to be in trouble if he feels that kind of stress. Um, also, when the Hulk absorbs more radiation or dark magic, that can also amplify his strength uh, e- even more so. There are many plot devices, though, where, where, where you'll see like the Hulk arguing with Banner. and it's, it's Banner subconsciously within the Hulk trying to restrain the Hulk from doing something. That he feels is going to, you know, be too destructive, uh, and, and so forth. So there's some stats here. So, as well, the Hulk cannot fly; he can leap, and they've established pretty early on that he can cover massive distances. Uh, according to the Marvel Wiki uh, file, he can cover a thousand miles in a leap at over 400 miles per hour. So it's one heck of a leap. Yeah, he's. That's what they said on Marvel Wiki. Um, as you see in the comic, he, he can ex- exhale his ex- exhale his breath as a pulverizing weapon. If he claps his hand together, it's a sonic boom, uh, essentially. His stamina increases with anger. He's basically invulnerable. We've only seen Wolverine hurt him with his adamantium claws, 
which can actually cut his hide, or vibranium, of course, can can harm him. But you want to add anything else you know about that murder? There was one point uh, in the mid-90s, I mm-hmm. think it was around the time of Heroes Reborn, actually, that uh, he was at ground zero of the detonation of uh, some kind of atomic weapon. might even have been a gamma bomb. He was basically reduced to a glowing green skeleton, but he completely regrew his flesh from that. Funny you mention that because when uh, Peter David did his classic uh, Future Imperfect, the maestro character, like the Hulk of the far distant future, at one point he rebuilt himself on the molecular level. So – He's effectively invulnerable, ladies and gentlemen. And some people, some some hazard the guess that he might even be immortal. Right. Basically, yes, he's actually got a t- series with that very word in the title. Out That's right correct. Now. The Immortal Hulk. And uh, the Hulk can withstand, as Murder just pointed out, nuclear explosions. The Human Torch's Nova Blast falls from the orb from orbit. <laughs> Maximum cold. Uh, the vacuum of space. Uh, he can regenerate, as Murder just pointed out. You know, tissues, organs. Base is immune to any disease. In fact, remember when Jim Wilson had uh, AIDS? Mm. Weren't they hoping the Hulk's blood could save him? Trying to remember that story. That was a classic by Peter David. Mm. Did you read that? I think I must have, but I don't. Someone can help us out. It failed. That's whatever they tried. It didn't work. Yeah, it didn't work. And that's long past worth covering in this episode. But someone can help us out with that in the forums as well. Um, Again, his his lifespan. When you you think about uh, like the classic. Old Man Logan storyline, the Hulk and his offspring are in that. Like, it's possibly he can't die. Basically, um, he has superhuman speed. Uh, he can go as fast as Namor underwater. Uh, he can. His biology is such that the Hulk can ad- adapt to basically any environment. This this is basically if you take away the the rage, this is the perfect living weapon, essentially. And and you can ma- see why various villains have tried to get their hands and control the Hulk because. When, if, you, if you control that kind of power, you, you essentially your options are limitless. Uh, the Hulk can withstand telepathic attacks. He can perceive astral form. So he could see Doctor Strange, for example, when he appears in his astral form. And, of course, he can absorb and radiate gamma energy, which is, almost makes him like a battery, essentially, for that type of power. And then Bruce Banner himself is no slouch either when it comes to mental capacity. Again, the, quote, fourth smartest person in the world of the universe – the greatest nuclear physicist um, in that universe. And I, I think in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they've done a nice job of showing you how important Banner is when he's not the Hulk and mm. uh, what he can bring to the table. It would be a crime to waste an actor like Mark Ruffalo. Yeah, mm. tremendous actor. So, you know, whether he's the Hulk or he's Banner, and, and really they're, they're one and the same, but essentially, this is a heavy hitter. Uh, in the Marvel Universe. And anything you want to add to these points, my friend? No, no I think you've covered it. Beautifully, Chris. and I, I, I'm sure a lot of listeners know a lot of this. I mean, because you know, if you've read it, a, a, any period of the Hulk's publication history, or even just seen in other media, a lot of this is covered. Like you, you know, the powers of this this creature, and it's just you know, and uh, there's many stories where you know the, the the other Marvel heroes have to like try to corral him, bring him in, and just it's like it's all hands on deck when those stories happen. No one alone can really take on the Hulk. And subdue him. So that's important to, to, to mention as well. And to go back to the first Avengers film when you know Cap tells the Hulk, "Smash!" <laughs> he just kind of grins yep. at him. <laughs> you know, he's <sighs> the power. All right, so we're going to plunge into our checklist. Um, and again, for those of listen, other spotlights this is where we, we cover what we, what we consider. Uh, Key events in, in, in the character's history in this in this era in, the, in this particular era, which in this case is the Silver Age, uh, the 1960s first appearance. One of the one of the fun things, and I'm, I know Murd will, will uh, concur, is that when you look over the history of the early Marvel characters, so many wonderful first appearances occur <laughs> of villains and supporting characters. Because you know, Lee and, and Kirby and Ditko and the other artists are these are the building blocks. They're building the Marvel universe. So. Go ahead, Murd. Watching the fantastic uh, turrets of imagination that they yes. construct from those blocks is just part of the fun of assembling a research project. Like exactly. This. And, of course, we should also mention, again, as the Hulk is very much a Cold War uh, creation, a lot of references to, to the Red Menace, <laughs> to the Kamis, you know, to the Russians, the Chinese, as, as it was in the early issues of Thor and, and Fantastic Four and Iron Man uh, and so forth. So the first issue of the Hulk, again, Banner is a you know, unassuming, albeit brilliant, nuclear physicist. And uh, they already established that you know, 
Thunderbolt Ross is, is sort of impatient with this, this sort of milksop character as he sees Banner. But of course, Betty um, – and Betty becomes a very complex and, and uh, enduring, interesting character on her own. But as is often the case, these early Silver Age issues – She's sort of the damsel in distress, the swooning, fretting, yes, perpetually distraught love interest. Yeah, substitute her with you know Jane Foster and a host of others. You kind of get that's kind of the template Lee was working from there. But again, all these characters will get their due down the road and really be be far more uh, elaborate in their characterization as the years pass. Now, why don't you, why don't you regale the audience? So, what is what, what key role does Rick Jones play in, in Hulk number one? Oh yes, that's <laughs> that is the good deed that goes et- for eternally punished yeah. uh, for for Bruce Banner. It keeps he's, on giving in that sense. He's yes. just your typical '60s teenager, as seen through the eyes of Stan Lee, who was not his a harm- '60s his teenager. <laughs> yep, he was on a dare from some other kids whose names he barely remembers. Years later, he drives his little dune buggy or jeep or whatever it was out onto the blast range and yeah. the, the government test site with a gas. A bomb prototype is about to be detonated, and he sits out there, and as you just said, Chris, he plays his harmonica on the brink of atomic doom. <laughs> and Bruce Banner, you know, he sees a chance to do one little act of human compassion, to save one life from a weapon that's designed to end thousands or millions of human yeah. lives, goes out there on the blast range per- personally and impetuously, pushes Rick down into a ditch or behind a, a trench embankment yeah, of yeah. some sort, and uh, but he doesn't have time to jump into the ditch after the trench after him. And in one of the most iconic origin oh, images in all of comics, his, image. with his <laughs> his uh, lab coat flapping in the atomic breeze, the, the the gamma bomb blast catches him, and his his fate is sealed. And, and just classic Kirby images of, of of Bruce caught in the blast. We should also mention that there's a Soviet agent. Doesn't he tell somebody to delay the test? And isn't the guy a, a Russian agent? Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, Igor Drenko, yes. I believe, is his name. Yeah. yeah, and he's a plant, and he's working for a higher placed Soviet agent called the Gargoyle. The Gargoyle, right? So there, there's some Cold War intrigue involved in the Hulk's uh, origin as well, and of course, this explains why Rick always feels beholden, loyal to Banner slash the Hulk, because he essentially is, is the reason why the Hulk is created. Um, and the rest of the story is. Uh, Banner transforms into, into the Hulk, the Gray Hulk, what's later known as the, the Joe Fixit Hulk mm-hmm. persona, who is more like Mr. Hyde. He's not like Hulk Smash yet. He, he's not – the Hulk's appearance changes too. Like he's not like as tall as you might think the Hulk would be in these early appearances. I mean he's massively strong. Like you know they have the classic image of like soldiers trying to stop him and they can't, that type of thing. Um but different artists will render the Hulk differently. Some render him as, you know, just this massive gargantuan beast. Uh, others, he's just, a, a, you know, a very large humanoid with just in- incredible muscles, but he's not necessarily gigantic. Uh, the hair, the brow, the visage varies from artist to artist as the Hulk, you know, morphs over time. Uh, what I'm reading, though, they sort of say that the, the classic, you know, it's like he's seven feet tall, that type of thing. Um you know, they get involved with the gargoyle has also been mutated by radiation. And that issue, of course, the gargoyle will actually sacrifice himself and send Banner and Rick. Because Banner and Rick end up behind the Iron Curtain, and the gargoyle then lets them go, and he he sacrifices himself. And that happens much later, though, right? It's also in issue one. Really? Yeah. It's that Issue one was a mul- – I think it was a, like, had multiple chapters in it, if I remember correctly. Oh, here I, I thought I'd read that story. Gargoyle sacrifices himself in the first issue? Yep. Because mm-hmm. number two is the Toad Men. <laughs> The Tribitite race, I believe they're called in, in, in retconning. Yes, yes. Uh, they're originally from the planet Croak, but uh, much like <laughs> – but yeah, K-R-O-K-E. But much like the Cree race who originated on Pama and constructed a new home world for themselves as like yeah. the administrative center of their empire, they built the planet Tribit. Mm-hmm. And that's how they came to be known as Tripitites. Yes. Yeah, they, they have uh, aspirations to becoming like a, a galactic power like the Kree Empire or the mm-hmm. Skrulls or the Shi'ar. But uh, uh, they're just so much shorter and uglier than so many of the other uh, humanoid races in the galaxy. They're, they're, they're kind of also rans as conquerors. Most of their advanced war uh, military technology was stolen or copied from other races. So they never they, they never quite get their They were also together. rans, yep. Yeah, uh, and uh, as seen in their first appearance when their initial – Invasion of Earth fails. And uh, the Hulk is now green in issue two. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a Lee Kirby Ditko production. So again, Stan has whatever artists on hand to help him out. 
uh, with, the, with these stories in the early years. Uh, later on, Peter David Grit will retcon that the Gray Hulk is part of Brad Banner's fractured psyche. There's different sort of Hulk personas to m- match certain elements of Banner's psyche. So you have like the childlike Hulk, like you, you said, Murd, is like that repressed child who's raging against the way he's been treated by his father. You have the cunning, conniving sort of Gray Hulk, who's actually smaller than like the big Green Hulk, mm. essentially. Yeah, so, just like Mr. Hyde is smaller than Dr. Jekyll, kind of think of it. Well done, sir. Well done. Issue three. Go ahead, Murd. <laughs> oh, okay. Classic here. All right. So uh, the Hulk and Rick Jones come up against uh, the Ringmaster and his Circus of Crime. Indeed. They're making their Marvel Universe debut here. Uh, much later, we learn that the Ringmaster was the son of a Captain America foe from the 40s called the Ringmaster of Death. Counted on that. And, and uh, But uh, the, the younger Ringmaster isn't interested in uh, killing people in the service to the Third Reich. He just wants to make a buck. So he's got this uh, hypnotic uh, spiral <laughs> disc hat, installed yeah. in his top hat that he uses to mesmerize <laughs> entire circus audiences while his uh, trained uh, performers slash uh, thieves underlings uh, pick everyone's pockets while they're just, uh, in a trance. And so he's, his circus originally consists of like a the, the clown is like a longtime fixture mm. of the circus of crime. He even took it over himself, the clown did later on. Uh, there's a strong man and a fat lady and uh, <laughs> the human cannonball, all, all of those guys. Uh, yeah, so the ringmaster and his circus of crime you know, just sort of wander you know, to, to be you know, itinerant performers, mm-hmm. as in the real world, they wander throughout all kinds of different titles in the Marvel Universe, face all kinds of different heroes and are thwarted by them. Um, but uh, the, the first encounter, the Hulk, in issue number three. This is their first appearance. And they'll pop up many times in the Marvel Universe uh, following. So, uh, I want, I'm skipping over to issue five, and I know Murray will appreciate this first appearance, Tyrannus. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, he's uh, the second uh, subterranean yes. underlord that uh, Stan and Jack introduced uh, to the Marvel Universe uh, not too long after the Mole Man. Uh, but uh, his deal is uh, he was an ancient Roman alchemist slash sorcerer, or so he described himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was really more like a scientist who was centuries ahead of his time, mm. um, who uh, – his real name was Romulus Augustulus, I think, but that wasn't revealed until much after mm. his first appearance here. Um, he tried to invade uh, the, the British Isles, um, but uh, he was uh, repulsed by uh, King Arthur and, and Merlin. I mm. think this is a, a sort of a historical uh, discrepancy there since I'm pretty sure ancient – King Arthur didn't come around until after the Roman Empire – had already the fallen. Roman Empire was very much in decline by the time the historical Arthur, as far as we know, appeared. Right. But uh, for the purposes of Stan and Jack mm. writing these comics, yeah. uh, he came. He ran afoul of Merlin who banished him underground. Mm. And there he found uh, the remnants of what was later retconned as deviant technology mm. and was able to establish his own little subterranean empire. He found an offshoot of the uh, subterranean race of uh, moloids mm-hmm. that the Mole Man employed. He called them his tyrannoids. And so <laughs> – There you go. <laughs> <laughs> He's basically a taller, more uh, uh, in, in, yeah, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Is in, imperial, mm. as a, a taller and more classically good-looking yeah. and, and Roman-like version of, uh, of of the Mole Man. And so the Hulk goes up against him in issue five. And the Mole Man, Tyrannus, will come in, come into blows at some point. Oh yeah, and in the well. not too distant future, yes. I think that actually falls within our. Uh, it sure does. Here. Uh, issue six, uh, Lee Ditko and Ayers, again, different artists coming in as needed, uh, is the first appearance of the Metal Master. And it's also where Bruce uses something called the Gamma Ray Projector. And if I remember correctly, and someone could correct me here on the forums if I'm a little off the mark, but this – suppose the idea of this machine is to help, help him sort of control his transformations. But in this case, he ends up with the Hulk body, but it's Bruce's head <laughs> – I never knew about yeah, this. Yeah, and so to conceal his identity, he puts on a Hulk latex mask so he can a- act as the Hulk in this issue. This issue is also the first appearance of the Teen Brigade, which is, which is Rick Jones' uh, club of ham radio enthusiasts. Who And they use they use their uh, radio network to communicate with each other and to – like the Teen Brigade plays a key role in Avengers number one because they're going to try to bring the Avengers t- – the characters together to fight uh, Loki and so forth. So obviously today they'd say that today they'd, they'd also be obviously using the internet, uh, you know, to, to communicate with each other digitally and so forth. But back then it was ham radios. It's the first appearance of Rick Jones, the team. And Rick Jones will play a key role in the Hulk, the Avengers, Captain Marvel, and he's going to get around in uh, in the Marvel universe. Professional superhero sidekick. And I'm is... surprised we haven't not seen him yet in the MCU. 
I have no idea how that has come about. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, it'll appear in the Captain Marvel film coming out. Uh, uh, is it next year? Yep, so, yep. It's it's coming up in the spring. So volume one is then canceled. Only six issues. And then the Hulk will, but again, legally realized he was had something. So he then appears in Fantastic Four number twelve, the first Hulk thing, Donny Brook. That becomes a, a, a tradition of its own in the Marvel universe. Mm. And uh, then he'll appear in Avengers one through three. He'll briefly be a member of the Avengers before he'll grow disenchanted and leave. Uh, yeah, we have the space fandom to thank for that. Yep. And we, yeah. t- we talked about that in our Avengers spotlights uh, a couple of years back. And the Avengers will spend some time trying to track the Hulk down. Mm. And again, this is, go ahead, Mert. I'm sorry. Yep, it's, it's like he. Beco- this is probably going to lead into what you're about to say anyway. But uh, he, for a few months there, in uh, I guess '63, uh, the Hulk kind of briefly becomes like this. Uh, I guess Stan had plans for him to become like the sympathetic uh, freelance peripatetic antagonist for just yes. about the entire Marvel universe. He drifts from book to book and runs afoul of various heroes. Yes. FF, Spider Man, Avengers. They're all trying to feel like you know that they're. They kind of recognize that the Hulk is, is, is not really a villain, but they feel like they have to kind of bring him to heel because of his power. And the Hulk, again, is still more the Hyde persona. I remember that remember the classic closing panel of Avengers 1 where he's standing there with his arms crossed, singing a bit, something like, you know, something like no one can, can stop us or something like that, where he's not, you know, you know Hulk smash yet. But mm-hmm. that's, that's coming. <laughs> All right, so the Hulk then appears in Tales to Astonish number 59. Enter the Hulk. Stanley, uh, Dick Ayers, Paul Ryman's a Kirby cover. Again, Kirby would often do the character designs, the cover layouts, wherever Stan could, could plug him in. You, you, Kirby's all over this. And this is where Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne, uh, this is, this is, they're, they're starring in this book. And they try to capture the Hulk in New Mexico because the Hulk has since fled the Avengers. And the human top... Want to talk about the human top at all, Murd? Uh, his real name is David Cannon, and of course. Uh, he's a mutant. I think we eventually learn he's a mutant with the power to spin really fast. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Eventually, he changed his name to Whirlwind, which is a good move on his part. Yes. And uh, Whirlwind becomes a, kind of a major adversary of Hank and Jan. Correct? Yes. He's yeah. uh, one of the probably the least lame member of uh, Ant Man or Pym's Rogues Gallery. And uh, we, we did our, our just recently Ant Man and the Wasp movie review. You talked about it. You're hoping that if they have a third Ant Man film, they put. Whirlwind in there. I think they so, can probably find at least a bit part for the characters. Yes. It's, it's a cool visual spinning around. Indeed. And all that. He tries to pit the heroes against each other. He is seemingly killed, obviously n- not permanently, Mm-mm. in a nuclear explosion. Issue 60 is important because of TTA because that's when the Hulk gets co-billing. So now he's back. He's not you know itinerant from book to book. Now he has a home now in Tales to Astonish, and he'll be there for the next four years. Issue 61 is very important when it comes to the Hulk supporting cast. The first appearance of uh, Glenn Talbot, who is uh, sort of uh, the second in command to Thunderbolt Ross. Anything you want to say about that character? Uh, well, he's kind of to the Hulk here what Steve Lombard would eventually be to Superman in the 70s. Well put, Murder. Because uh, just as the Hulk's got his share of arch enemies, Talbot is an enemy not only to the Hulk but to Bruce Banner because he f- f- fancies himself a rival for Love Betty triangle. Ross's affections. Yes. With with Bruce, I don't think Betty necessarily regards him the same way as he does himself. But uh, no, he, he's certainly there, and he's providing a healthy bit of antagonism for Bruce's life. Yes, as, as well as for the Hulk. And the Talbot is a capable soldier. Um, you know, he's often shown as being you know brave, and and you know he's no dummy. Like he's he's a you know he's a shrewd tactician. But again, he's that he's that like you said, he's that fly in the moment for both Bruce and the Hulk. Although sometimes they, 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 he's not quite as obsessed as Ross seems to be with uh, this whole quest or to, to Ahab with his whale. Um, and, and they actually use Talbot in, in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show. Uh, they, have, they have a, a, a Glenn Talbot uh, character there, even with the mustache. Great. Um, TTA 62 is a very important issue in, the, in sort of the history of the Hulk. The first appearance of the leader as uh, conceived and designed by Steve Ditko. Um Murd, go ahead. Well, speaking of mustaches, <laughs> uh, uh, his real name was Samuel Stearns, and he was just uh, an average intelligence uh, laboratory lackey. He was basically a custodian. Custodian, yeah. And uh, he was uh, removing some toxic waste uh, one day <laughs> when he was exposed to radiation. Of course. You know, abracadabra. He's been <laughs> – trans- he wakes up uh, after recu- a period of recuperation with green skin, a uh, high forehead, I'll and say. he grew a mustache yeah. in the meantime. It, 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 it is very – very uh, Ditko-esque yes. design. And he found that he had uh, fant- 
fantastically enhanced intelligence and immediately conceived a scheme to uh, covertly take over the world. Which we'll try many times. Yeah. And eventually we do learn about him and about gamma radiation in general. Mm. But in the Marvel Universe, uh, gamma radiation, uh, it's got kind of a psychosomatic effect and it uh, mutates different people exposed to it in different ways depending on their – well, on facets of their psyche. Yes. It it just kind of taps into their minds and uh, mutates their exteriors in ways that uh, are sort of in sync with what's going on in their minds. So that's why we get different uh, effects of gamma radiation for different people. It's not all just big muscular things stomping around. And that's a good point. Sometimes we get the leader, sometimes we get the harpy, and sometimes we get hulks. And Doc Samson gamma radiation? Definitely. Okay. That's what I thought. The green hair. Mm. Um, And the leader is... A brilliant, I mean, mastermind, strategist. Uh, he's he's off. I mean, he's appeared throughout the Marvel universe. But he's, he's usually associated with the Hulk as one of the Hulk's uh, key rogues. And as Murd said, he's not like a physically strong individual. It's it's, all, it's like you know the huge uh, head because <laughs> his mind has been his brain power has been dramatically expanded by the exposure to gamma radiation. So he'll appear throughout the Hulk's history. Uh, his origin is is uh, in issue sixty three, um, and we'll, we'll, we're going to return to the character several times here. I thought sixty four issue sixty four particularly interesting because I love when Marvel will, will go into again. It's all they're all supposed to be. This is all supposed to be happening in the real world, right? The appeal of the Marvel comics was that you would see landmarks, people, uh, situations that are, that are, that have a, a, that that coincide with reality. So, President Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> In confidence with Rick, agrees to give Bruce Banner a pardon. And Rick will use his Avengers badge to gain access to the Oval Office. <laughs> Just walks right in, I guess, with, with his Avengers ID card in issue 64. Uh, issue 65, I'd like to point out again the Cold War underpinnings <laughs> on the rampage against the Reds. I ask forgiveness in advance for this, but. Hulk in the USSR! Oh. You don't know, look at you, war, Chris! <laughs> You know, I, when I got up in the morning today, you know, anticipating the trek out here, I was counting on these moments, Murd, and you never, never disappoint. <laughs> got to make it worth the trip for you, Chris. Uh, without question. So the Soviets capture Banner. They want to use him to their own ends. Talbot thinks Banner's a traitor that he's gone over, which, of course, he hasn't. These are uh, – I'm not saying this dismissive. These, these are like sort of like the stock stories that Stan Lee would pull out of his hat. You know, Iron Man, Thor, the Hulk – there's, there's always there's always you know red menace communist intrigue going on uh, in these stories. This is, this is typical of that. Uh, issue sixty nine through seventy four trapped in the lair of the leader. So in these stories, and we talked about this before again that psyche that fractured psyche. The, the Hulk temporarily has Banner's mind, so Banner's in control of the Behemoth. And there's a situation where there's a bullet in the Hulk's brain. Which, if he turns back to Banner, will kill him. So the leader actually removes the bullet from the Hulk's brain so Banner can survive. I'm, I'm assuming the, the leader wants to use the Hulk to his own purposes. And the leader seemingly dies in issue 74. He'll, he'll return, though, in the Incredible Hulk issue 115. So he's, he's gone for a little while, actually. Um, but he'll return many times to uh, – Act as a foil for the Hulk. Go ahead, Murd. May I? Oh, uh, having mentioned uh, the leader using the Hulk for his own schemes. Please. Uh, one thing I wanted to interject. In issues 70 and 71, one scheme the leader uses mm. the Hulk in that's of interest. He sends the Hulk into outer space to the homeworld of the Watchers, uh, where he is to retrieve uh, the somewhat hyperbolically and self-importantly named Ultimate Machine of the Watchers, <laughs> which is just a highfalutin name for their master database. It's the computer that uh, gathers and collates information and observations that the Watchers have made throughout the universe. Which the leader can use, no doubt, for his campaigns of conquest. Absolutely. Meanwhile, Hulk runs into an alien uh, warrior named the Amphibion of the Xantarian Empire, <laughs> who has been sent by his masters to do exactly the same thing, get that ultimate machine. Now, let me explain why Murd is the ultimate co-pilot, because when I was doing my research, I noted a lot of these points, but I said, you know what, I'm not going to fill up my notes too much because I know Murd's going to bring a lot of this to the table anyway. Sir, once again, CGS Medal of Valor will be pinned on your breast. It is my honor to serve. <laughs> All right. So again, I, I love I love the, the the real world references. So in issue seventy five, uh, Ross is holding Rick Jones prisoner because he thinks correctly that Rick knows who the Hulk actually is, 
and the Hulk goes to the White House to try to appeal for Rick's release. So imagine the Hulk you know, landing on the South Lawn, you know, demanding that you know the authorities release Rick Jones. I'm picturing a scene like the day the Earth stood still. Ah, uh, yes. In fact, I think that is what greets him because uh, somehow he gets hit by a time displacement ray and sent 500 years into the future. Those pesky time displacement rays. Issue 77, the title, Bruce Banner is the Hulk. So Rick thinks the Hulk is dead, so he reveals his ID, the Hulk's ID, to Talbot. So in this – like Lee doesn't wait that long for people to know that Bruce Banner is the Hulk, which I think was a good move because it adds to that the drama. You know, um, People who care about Bruce or, or, or also uh, – Nemesis of Bruce now also that they that fly on the ointment now for the character. Uh, so issue seventy eight. This is done by Kirby and Bill Everett. And Jack Kirby always said one of his favorite inkers was the gr- the late great Bill Everett. Of course, the creator of the Submariner. Mm. Also drew the first Daredevil story. Yes, yes, he did. And Everett again, Stan Lee. From what I read, always had a soft spot for old time creators who were hard on the luck or couldn't get work. I remember, he briefly gave Jerry Siegel work at Marvel. Mm. Um, and uh, Bill Everett comes back. And he'll, he'll return to his creation, the Submariner. Tragically, he'll die in 1973. But Kirby always loved when everyone ink him. And in issue 78, Rick tells Betty that the Hulk is Bruce Banner. So and th- that 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 complexity is not added to their relationship because Betty is very much in love with Bruce, but she of course fears and dreads the Hulk. So again, that classic Marvel uh, plot device, just like how Gwen Stacy, before she knew Peter was Spider Man, you know, sort of. Especially after Catherine Stacy is killed by the Doctor Octopus, she kind of blames Spider Man for that, but she loves Peter. Again, that the characters find themselves in these impossible situations. Do I give up being the hero for the love of my life? But in the case of of, of Bruce, he can't give up being the Hulk. I mean, he's he's trapped. So, okay, <laughs> issue seventy nine: The Titan and the Torment. I love the Lee hyperbolic titles. This is Kirby and Everett again. So Hercules. Wants to act in the movies, and he's on a train going to Hollywood, I think. And the Hulk lands in the tracks, and lo and behold, a Donnie Brook ensues. We also we, we've talked about in our Thor spot. That's how, how Thor and Hercules will go at it, and they fight. And of course, it's a stalemate. One cannot decisively beat the other. But any chance to have two major uh, powerhouses fight it out, Lee Kirby and and the and the other artists will certainly bring that to the readers. Or anything you want to add to this point? Uh, well, uh, you know, this is not the first, uh, the last time the Hulk and Hercules will. No, clash definitely because, not. Uh, eventually, Hercules takes over the Hulk's whole title for a time for an excellent run. Oh, I the, never uh, read those stories in the latter two thousands. Oh yes, that's yes. uh, Fred Van Lente. Excellent. Yes, or or was it or was it Greg Pak? No, it, it was Greg Pak. I, I apologize. It might have been Van Lente too, but uh, I know Amadeus Cho was uh, part yes. of the Hulk's uh, or Herc's supporting cast at that point. So. Ah, uh, but anyway, whoever wrote them, they were good stories. Um, let me see, have we t- you, you just mentioned uh, Hulk versus Thor. Uh, I might throw in their uh, Journey into Mystery Ooh, number 112. Well done. Uh, cover dated January of 65, which is a full-length Hulk-Thor battle, which kind of expands on a clash between the two that happened in the third issue of Avengers. And I think, I think, I think the premise of the story was some kids were asking Thor, who's stronger, you or the Hulk, which of course one of those recurring questions – and Thor is telling them the tale, and I, I believe the battle was a stalemate in uh, Journey of Mystery 112. Wasn't Magneto in that story too? I think he's on the cover. Hmm. I, I, I don't remember that. Yeah. Rings a bell. All right. Uh, issue 81. All right. Two uh, important first appearances are emerged. The Secret Empire, one of the great Marvel subversive organizations, the, the hoods with the numbers on them. Mm-hmm. The Shades of the Prisoner. Yes, right, right. And, and number one was, of course, the head of the Secret Empire. Now, the classic uh, Englehart uh, Captain America stories of the Bronze Age. It's revealed uh, sort of off-camera, off panel that the leader of the Secret Empire was actually Richard Nixon, <laughs> which will lead to uh, Cap being totally uh, demoralized, disillusioned. That's when he takes on the Nomad persona. Uh, if you want to read some great Marvel Bronze Age, those Englehart Captain America stories are classics. Also see uh, the... Uh, Captain America, the Bronze Age Spotlight, helmed by Peter Rios uh, way back when. Good stuff there. And we're going to hold forth on the significance of the boomerang. 
Oh, boomerang. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, he's, he's kind of become a you know, journeyman uh, Marvel Universe uh, mercenary and, and criminal. Um, Nick Spencer has taken a shine to him. He made him a cast member of his superior foes yes. as Spider-Man. And he will be popping up again as Spider-Man's roommate, I think, in Nick Spencer's upcoming Amazing That's Spider-Man right. run. But first, he was uh, employed by the Secret Empire as a weapon against the Hulk. His real name is Fred Myers, born in Australia, raised in the United States. He became a baseball player, a pitcher peerless uh, throwing arm. Um, but then he was dis, uh, caught taking bribes and uh, drummed out of the major leagues in disgrace. So he turned to crime and used that pitching arm uh, for, for as like a, a mercenary for hire and also like a master uh, the robber bandit. And I'd never seen what his original costume looked like until I was started researching mm-hmm. this, Chris. And ugh, my goodness. Uh, it's, picture the head, legs, and torso are basically the... the the, the color scheme and design of Hawkeye's costume, mm-hmm. basic purple. But then somebody decided, ah, yellow polka dot baggy sleeves. <laughs> so <laughs> that's right. <laughs> he's like mostly Hawkeye, but with a little bit of the old Charlton character, the Jester, thrown in for or not Charlton, oh, quality comics character from the Golden Age, Chuck Lane, the Jester, thrown in there, and it it, it doesn't work. And he later gets the, the sort of the more classic boomerang costume, like the boomerangs on his body, right? Like the headpiece mm-hmm. and so forth. And yeah. like the, the, the chest plate is two yeah. giant boomerangs facing each other. He's had a few different costumes yeah. over the years, any one of which is an improvement over what he wears on the cover <laughs> of, uh, of Tales to Astonish number 80. <laughs> and 80 to 83 also involves um, – the Hulk ending up in a war, we talked about this before, between the two great subterranean monarchs in the Marvel Universe, Tyrannus oh, and the Mole Man. That's right. That was in 80. The boomerang was on the cover of 81. Yes. Me. Yes. But yeah, that is <laughs> good on Lee to realize that he had repeated himself so quickly and then uh, you know, parlaying that into a good story. And the Secret Empire, of course, they've been around. They've, been, they've popped up periodically ever since. When you think of like the great Marvel subversive groups, Hydra, AIM, um, the Secret Empire is way up there uh, as well. And again, they're, they're definitely those classic uh, Bronze Age stories in Cap are where I really think of the Secret Empire. But again, when you think of that, we're talking about the time of James Bond, Spectre, you know, you know Marvel's going to ape a lot of that with Nick Fury, all these different you know, sinister groups uh, that the heroes have to combat. Right, 84, I just want, I wanted to point out because they have the Hulk. This is one of the classic plot devices. The character, again, is seeking companionship, seeking somebody or, or someone or something – that will accept him for who he is. He's actually trying to find the Avengers. Seeing that they'll take him back in. Of course, the police are hounding him. He ends up on a railroad tracks. So he saves a subway car. So again, the Hulk obviously is, is not evil, but he, because of his appearance, his power, uh, his, his mental state, he often finds himself again being hounded uh, by the authorities. It's a running theme throughout the character's history. Uh, it's just 85 to 87. You have, you have the great John Buscema now uh, drawing the Hulk. He's, he's, b- he's back in the Marvel fold. Again, he'll make his mark primarily with the Avengers and the Silver Surfer. But he also did some Hulk work. And uh, this is where, the, where Banner has to come to the fore to, to try to ha- stop a missile. So you need both Banner's intellect and the Hulk's strength. Um, so you need Banner's technological prowess and also the, the Hulk's strength to redirect this missile. And Ross, in his hatred of the Hulk, and this is not a good idea, activates one of the, one of the leaders who supposedly dead, one of the leader's Hulk killer robots. Oh, yes. One of his line of humanoids. Yes. Which the leader has used from the very beginning, his very first appearance. They're like synthetic, plastic, rubberized little little guys that uh, – they, 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 he designed a whole bunch of different uh, yeah. models of those. And I guess this is one of the larger ones that Hulk comes across here. And the Hulk is victorious, but he's, 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 he's incapacitated by the battle. And in issue 89, which is drawn by the great Gil Kane, another legendary artist who, who will come to the Marvel fold, uh, a favorite character of Merge, the Stranger, brainwashes the Hulk to attack humanity. We're going to hold forth briefly on the significance of the Stranger. Uh, well, at this point in Marvel history, the Stranger was very new and very mysterious. Yes. <laughs> uh, but he, he appeared as just like this. In the X-Men too, didn't he? Yeah, that, that was yeah, his very yeah, first yeah. appearance, yeah. Um, he was just this. Uh, he appeared as this dapperly dressed elder gentleman, a tall and regal of bearing, fancy with mustache, a white mustache, yeah. and a little well-trimmed uh, 
mini beard to go with it, uh, who uh, just kind of popped up on Earth several times examining its uh, superhuman population, its mutants, and in this case, its uh, gamma spawn monstrosities. Uh, we eventually learn that he's like this hive consciousness uh, uh, produced by the, the, the survivors of the alien planet Gigantus, I believe. <laughs> uh, but he, 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 he's a fairly major player on the cosmic stage. Um, and so, it, but his motives at this point in time are, are very much unknown and mystery. He, he's just kind of looking around the galaxy for what we don't know. But he doesn't like what he finds on Earth. So, as you say in your notes here, Chris, uh, the, the stranger brainwashes the Hulk as his uh, weapon of destruction. Uh, to just uh, he p- sends the Hulk out to attack uh, human beings and uh, wreck as all the uh, strongholds of their civilization, just to, to break the Earth down. Uh, for whatever purpose uh, the stranger may have in mind for it later. And, and this leads into issue 90, also by Gil Kane. This is a key key moment in the Hulk's history, the first appearance of the Abomination, a.k.a. Emil Blonsky. Murd, proceed. Ah, uh, yes, an enemy agent, uh, Zuga- Yugoslavian by birth, I believe. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he's infiltrated uh, the Hulkbuster base. He's supposed to take pictures of some of the gamma ray technology in there. Um, but uh, he happens to be there when Bruce comes in to try to uh, make one more last-ditch attempt to uh, neutralize the Hulk in himself, even if it means killing himself with an overdose of gamma radiation. Mm. Um, but he gets knocked away from the machine, and Blonsky then sort of stumbles in between the electrodes, and uh, he receives this jolt of gamma radiation that uh, turns him into his own uh, gamma-mutated, uh, uh, subconsciously informed avatar, uh, which is a being that uh, looks something like the Hulk, but is sort of reptilian in aspect, yes, scaly those skin. Ears. Yes, fin- yes, those, <laughs> that's when you think those the webbed fins those around the ears. Yes, yeah. yeah, iguana-like. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, But he, he gets out from the machine just before it uh, mutes and mutates him to the point of death. And he's got uh, strength that uh, is, uh, at the very least, the equal of If the not Hulk's. stronger. Right. Yeah. And he retains his full human intellect. Yes. So he's a formal adversary. I mean, some would say he's the Hulk's arch enemy. He's definitely way up there when it comes to uh, the Hulk's rogues gallery. He and the leader are probably yeah. neck and neck. Yeah. Um, and in the story, Bruce wants to kill himself so he can get, get, break free of the stranger's control. He ends up, of course, in a dining brook with the abomination. Mm-hmm. And it's Betty that gives him that name. Yes, that's right. Well done. Some kind of abomination. And uh, in issue 91, uh, Banner uses again – again, this is where Bruce Banner's intellect is so important. He uses his knowledge and technology to lure Blonsky back to the Gamma base. And the Hulk is actually defeating him now, but then the stranger teleports Blonsky away perhaps to use him for his own purposes uh, – down the road, and the abomination will appear many times in the Hulk comic uh, going forward. And in fact, in the Incredible Hulk movie, the MCU movie, I think the, yeah, the, the abomination was the adversary in that film. Right. Yeah. You know, it's played by Tim Roth, if I remember correctly. All right. Uh, issues ninety two, ninety three. We have a Silver Surfer appearance. Always one of Lee's favorite characters. Uh, and this is where Marie Severin is doing a lot of. She, she'll pencil the Hulk for quite some time. Uh, Marie Severin was was. One of the great artists of, of the Silver Age. She was a penciler, a colorist, uh, cover designs, also known for a wicked sense of humor. Uh, one of the few women working in comics uh, in this era. I believe she's still living. But she's, oh, she's quite old now. Um, Tomorrow's did a wonderful history of her life, uh, which, which is – I have to what's it, is it called? Mark, look that up for me, the name of the book. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, it's a wonderful book where they, where they go into her entire history and her, her significance in the, in the history of the American comic book medium. What's amusing about these issues, again, now we rem- very much have the childlike sort of you know, Hulk in, in terms of his ability to express himself. He thinks the surfer is a spaceship, <laughs> and he wants him to take him away from Earth because he's just tired of being hounded. And the surfer realizes that, that you know, the Hulk is a tormented figure. He tries to use his power cosmic, the power cosmic. To cure, to cure Banner, but the Hulk is enraged and drives him off, and he, he loses this opportunity perhaps to uh, – for Banner to free himself of the Hulk. Well, go ahead, Bird. Uh, the, uh, the book in question is called Marie Severin, The Mirthful Mistress of Comics. Excellent. I highly recommend that. Uh, issue 94 is important because that's when Herb Trimpey, one of the great Hulk artists, first gets involved. He's inking over Severin. Uh, both Trimpey and Marie Severin worked in the bullpen. In the late 1960s, so they they were both present. Uh, remember, many of the artists they're they're mailing their work in, but they they're both often in the office. 
and collaborating here. More on Herb Trimpey uh, shortly. Uh, so issues 94 to 96. The, this is a storyline featuring one of Murd's favorite characters, the High Evolutionary. And issue 94, To the Beckoning Stars. So it's a Lee Severin Trimpey production, 1967. Uh, basically, the, the High Evolutionary is new men. Murd, want to explain all this? Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, High Evolutionary was a, an evolutionary biologist uh, who uh, was doing some pretty advanced experiments with animals and actually managed to hyper-evolve uh, some of his test animals into uh, humanoid beings with human-level intelligence. And these he named his new men. They or later, the Knights of Wondergore. Right. They eventually uh, assumed kind of an Arthurian affectation yes. and named themselves the Knights of Wondergore after Wondergore Mountain in the fictional European country of Transia where they eventually made their home. A lot of things go on at Wondercore Mountain in the Marvel Universe, as we've noted in many past episodes. Oh, yes. So in this case, the new men are revolting, and the High Evolutionary wants to speed up Banner's evolution t- so he can make the Hulk even more powerful to take on his new men. And by the way, issue 95, one of my all-time favorite Hulk covers with the blurb, Go, 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 Hulk! <laughs> um, just out so of 60s. nowhere. It's just fantastic. But – um. It, it, in, in the melee that ensues, the high evolutionary has to actually advance his own evolution to try to stave off the revolt by the new men. He advances himself by 10 million years, and this is the high evolution becomes like a, an energy being essentially, right? right? Like right. godlike. It's, it's yeah. just like this uh, little quantum packet of energy inside of a humanoid suit of armor, yeah. and that's pretty much the way he remains for most of the rest of his time in comics. You know, He fluctuates a bit from time to time. Uh, but yeah, uh, did it devolve to an ape at one point? Too? That, that that was during Mark Wade's Kazar series. Okay. I think that, that Great I, I remember that. Like yeah. The last page of the issue the was him taking off, and he's a gorilla underneath. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but High Evolutionary is a classic. That's a pure Kirby concept. The armor, everything, the motif, everything about it. Clearly inspired by some high concept, uh, a bit of uh, 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 scientific theory that uh, Kirby had read recently. Yes, without question. And, you know, what makes that go, go, go Hulk verb, that blurb even more ridiculous, though, is that the Hulk is strapped down to the High Evolutionary's laboratory table at the time, so he can't really <laughs> go, go, go anywhere. I just love the exuberance. Yep, that's a classic example of hero a go, go. Yep. <laughs> the camp age. All right, issue 100 of Tales to Astonish. Let there be battle. So it's the Hulk versus the Submariner. And we Murd mentioned before the puppet mash at the beginning of our episode – that, that animated uh, episode that, that so uh, frightened you as a kid. We're going full circle here. So the puppet master manipulates the Hulk into attacking Rick. Um, or is it Namor? I forgot which. But anyway, Namor had foiled one of the puppet master's schemes. So he pits Namor and the Hulk against each other. And uh, eventually what happens is um, the Hulk uh, – they, they can't defeat each other. And the Hulk ends up uh, in Asgard, which we'll talk about in a moment. But uh, this issue also expo- explores how Betty, she loves Bruce, but she fears the Hulk. She's torn by that. And the, it, Betty, as they develop the character, she's a very tragic character really because she loves uh, Bruce Banner. She wants to be with him. But you know, Banner is, is, is obviously a, a severely damaged person in terms of what he's gone through in his life, not just being the Hulk. But you know, and, and, and re- let's, let's go, go to real life in a moment. Anyone who dealt with the child that he dealt with – you know that, that that that's a real hurdle to try to overcome and deal with throughout your life. She's she's grappling with that, and plus Talbot loves her. He wants to be with her, so that whole love triangle aspect as well. Anything you want to add to that, Murd? Mm, no, sir. All right, all right. Issue one one is the last issue of actually Tales to Astonish. Uh, before it, it, it's uh, before both the Hulk and Namor get their own books. So where walks the immortals? This is a, a Lee Severin and. Uh, Giacoya, Frank Giacoya was a great inker who worked for an artist as well, worked for pencil worked for Marvel in this period. So good old Loki <laughs> manipulates the Hulk into attacking the Warriors Three. You know, the, the classic trio of, of uh Fandral the Dashing, Hogan the Grim, and Volstag the Voluminous. See our Thor spotlights for more on that. Uh more on Lee and Kirby's take on the three musketeers. Forsooth. <laughs> uh they try to. They realize the Hulk is in Loki's thrall. They try to help him, uh, but Loki is ticked off, so he transforms the Hulk into Banner and throws him into a chasm, <laughs> where he seemingly is going to perish. And then we transition over to the Incredible Hulk 102, 1968. So the Hulk gets his own title again because again, Marvel has broken free from the, 
you know, the, the prison of uh, DC's independent news uh, circulation deal, public uh, uh, distribution deal, excuse me. Now they can print more titles. So 68, you see uh, Submariner number one, the classic Buscema cover, Silver Surfer number one. Um, Iron Man number one, the classic colon cover. All these heroes, Captain America, uh, Tales of Suspense becomes Captain America 100. All these characters were, were confined to the house books, except for, for poor Hank and Jan. They're, you'll see them in Avengers. They get their own titles at this point. So, issue one or two is written actually by Gary Friedrich. Is this the first Hulk story not written by Stan Lee? I think so. Um. Nine out of ten, sure about that. Don't quote me. But by the late '60s, because Lee was doing so much, by this point, you know, Roy Thomas had come on uh, payroll in '65. Gary Friedrich was an old childhood friend of Roy Thomas's from Missouri. He comes to uh, Manhattan. He gets a job also working for Marvel. Friedrich is an excellent writer. Um, I, I'm going to point out here just a quick aside. I mentioned this before on the air. He did a, a, a tremendous interview on his life in comics in. The original volume of the Tomorrow's Magazine comic book artist issue 13, May 2001 cover date. Gary Friedrich was I, I was I always was an outstanding writer. He co-created Ghost Rider, for example, but he had he had struggled with drinking. Mm. And in this interview, he, he's very forthright about his whole life, life in the bullpen. He talks about all the people he interacted with: Lee, Marie Severin, Roy Thomas, and also his, his own personal struggles. It's one of the best interviews by a comic creator I've ever read. So if you can track down comic artist, uh, volume one, issue 13, I highly recommend that. But he was very much present in the Marvel Universe in the late 1960s. So this issue, he's working with Marie Severin and the great inking team. Listen to this. George Tuska and the great Sid Shores, another golden age uh, artist who Lee gave work to. I love Shores inking. Um, and the Enchantress shows up, always scheming. She saves Banner from the fall, and she wants to use the Hulk as part of a troll invasion of Asgard. Uh, the, the Hulk won't play ball, so she kills him with her magic, and then Odin shows up and takes pity on the Hulk. The Warriors Three talk about what the Hulk did, and he resurrects him, but the Hulk is unaware of this, and he's ungrateful, and Odin, always temperamental, or to put it in layman's terms, Odin's always a dick, and he exiles the Hulk into space for not being grateful enough to it because you know Odin resurrected him. But of course, we noted in the beginning of our spotlight, the Hulk can survive in the vacuum of space. Mm, indefinitely. And issue 103 introduces the Space Parasite. Anything you want to say about him, Murd? Uh, okay. Good King uh, Randau of the planet <laughs> Zeron. Uh, he, his planet was under threat by an alien invasion, so he had his scientists uh, do a conversion process on him that made him kind of an energy siphon. Mm. And uh, that allowed him to fight off the invaders, but he got kind of drunk with the power and so went gallivanting around the cosmos looking for other people or races to beat up on. He was just spoiling for a fight. And he found in the Hulk the, sort of an endless source of, of energy uh, off which, from which to leech. Um, in fact, it was a little more than he could digest, and the Hulk uh, was able to put the kibosh on him. And uh, in issue 103 uh, – uh, fooled by the puppet master, Rick Jones goes on a, a, a show called The Jack Klein Show, so a Marvel Universe late night show, and he states the Hulk is a menace. So Rick is, is manipulated. He turns on the Hulk, his only friend, the Hulk's only friend, and the Hulk will actually defeat the sp space parasite at Yankee Stadium. And again, Marvel trying to bring the real world that they, they tell you in the comic, well, the Yanks were at Shea Stadium playing the Mets for something called the Mayor's Trophy Game. So if you're a baseball fan, maybe you can go on the forums and give us a little more information about you know, what the mayor's trophy game was, if, if that was a real thing. Um, issue 104. Rhino! Rhino! <laughs> there needed to be a delay there. Yeah, you better believe it. <laughs> T entitled Ring Around the Rhino. This is also written by Friedrich. Um, now, the rhino has lost his powers, uh, I, th I guess, after he was defeated by Spider-Man uh, in, in those classic issues by Romita Sr. And the Soviets say, look, we'll give it – because remember, Rhino was a Cold War Soviet agent. We'll give you your powers back, but you, but, but you, you got to work for us and abduct Bruce Banner so we can use him for our own purposes. But the Hulk defeats the Rhino in battle. So the Rhino will return, though, as an of the Hulk more than once, though. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, go ahead, Murray. Do you want to say something? No. no. So issue 105 is written by Roy Thomas and Bill Everett. Art by uh, Marie Severin and, John, and George Tuska. And this one you, – you see many times where Reed Richards tries to help Banner deal with his condition. He builds the, the device to change the Hulk back to Bruce Banner, but again, it doesn't stick. So just kind of like the Reed always trying to, trying to revert the thing back to Benjamin J. Grimm. 
either read or, or ban himself, always trying to find ways to c- sort of cure himself. But again, that kind of goes back to the whole retconning of can Banner even really cure himself or is the Hulk just really part of him because that's that's the rage part of his persona, of that fractured psyche. So Peter David gets a lot of mileage with, with those concepts. Um, and hopefully get to that you know, at some point, probably way down the road with the, the, the time it takes to do these, these, these days. All right. Issue 106, the great, late, great Archie Goodwin, also writing for Marvel at this point, working with, with Roy Thomas and Marie Severin, Herb Trimpey, Art inking over her. Uh, introduces Nick Fury's Soviet counterpart, Yuri Breslov. Apparently during World War II, Fury and Breslov would work together in their commando missions against the Third Reich. And what uh, this issue is another interesting example of retconning. So original sin number five reveals that Dum Dum Dugan was an LMD, that he had died in 1966. Hmm. Uh, but then New Avengers Volume 4, issue 70 says, no, wait a minute. They transmitted his his mind from his dying body into the LMD, so it's still actually Dum Dum Dugan mentally. <laughs> so again, kind of going in knots to try to explain how people like Nick Fury, Gabe Jones, Dum Dum Dugan are still alive. Mm. Um, well, I guess they couldn't use the infinity formula for all of them. Yeah, but, but uh, my, my attitude now as a, as a middle-aged man is just have fun with it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> It's, it's the Marvel time slide, as they call it. So, well, Speaking of fun with time. Please. Before we move on to number 107, numbers 105 and 6 also introduce uh, the missing link, an occasional uh, Hulk uh, antagonist slash supporting character. And he's basically a, a, a primitive form of human being um, who was uh, living on the Asian continent many uh, moons ago, uh, who was uh, trapped underground in suspended animation and revived by Chinese atomic tests and uh, brought to the surface with weird new um, mutated atomic powers. And he and the, folk, the Hulk face off, and, and eventually he he reforms. He's, he's a peace-loving figure, right. he's the missing link. He assumes the identity of Lincoln and settles down. That's his, his human alias. And he settles down with family, a family somewhere in the uh, the Blue Mountains in, in, in the United States, I think. But I this feel is like he appeared in an issue of Rom as Link. God, that's, that's really – oh, that's ringing a bell. Maybe someone can come to my rescue in the forums, but that, that – that, ah, Murd. Clutch. All right, issue 107 is also important because it's the first time that Herb Trimpey is now the pencil on Incredible Hulk. When we think about characters associated with Herb Trimpey, people think of Wolverine and the Hulk as, as two of the biggest ones. And 107, he have been inking over Marie Seven for quite some time. Now he's, he's, he's given the reins. And I'm going to read a quote from him. Now, Tumars did a wonderful book on Herb Trimpey, too, called The Incredible Herb Trimpey by Dewey Cassell and Aaron Sultan. And uh, the book was uh, completed shortly before Trimp's tragic death. Trimp died, I want to say it was 2015. I actually had the honor of meeting him at a couple shows, and I commissioned a Snake Eyes sketch, a G.I. Joe Snake Eyes sketch, which he, 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 he did for me and, and mailed to me. So nice, so personable. Um, and he, you know, th- this book is a wonderful retrospective of his whole life, his career. There's a lengthy interview with him. Uh, I'm going to read here a, a, a blurb about his time on the Hulk. Okay, let's see. Uh, so he's talking about how he views the Hulk. So that's what the way I consciously or subconsciously always thought of the Hulk, that he was a monster. What people in the 18th century would have called a monster, but really a person who was born deformed would have wished like anything to be like everybody else. That's the way I saw the Hulk. That's the way Roy saw the Hulk. I think that's the way Len saw the Hulk, meaning Len Wein. It was an abomination, no pun intended, for the Hulk to be what he was. That's the human side that he never lost. That's why there was a theme of pathos in humanity that ran through the Hulk's character. So it's a sort of an interesting continuation of the whole, you know, the monster, the Jekyll and Hyde, the, you know, the character who is seeking to be accepted, really, to, to find uh, companionship and, and, and solace. And, uh, you know, Trimpey's Hulk, is, for me, is one, of the, is one of the definitive Hulks. We think about how the Hulk is rendered, the way he draws his face, the teeth, the hair, uh, you know, the stance, you know, the, the, the fists, the muscles. I mean, when I think of the Incredible Hulk in comics, Herb Trimpey was one of the first artist you know, I think of. you have anything you want to say about Trimpey on the Hulk? Or? Oh, just to especially uh, add uh, my, my, my own, the weight of my own observation behind what you said about the way he drew the hair. Mm. As we move into the 70s, Hulk gets more and more mop-topped. Yes, that tussled, 
tussled here. It's very Herb Trimpey. Um, and, I mean, many of the Hulk's classic stories are rendered by Trimpey. Everybody thinks of Hulk 181, of course, uh, the first appearance of Wolverine. But Trimpey worked on the character for quite some time. Um, issue 107 is, is his first where he's, he's penciling and uh, inked by the great Sid Shores. The, the title, Ten Rings, Half the Mandarin. So, again, villains aren't exclusive. They cross over. Again, it's the Marvel Universe. Everybody knows everybody else in a sense. And issue 108 – uh, and now Stan Lee, by the way, is writing the book again. So Lee has returned uh, to penciling. I mean, excuse me, to scripting the Hulk. So he's working with Trimpy, and Trimpy would because Trimpy would come in the office. He talk about how when he'd work with Stan, you know, this, this is not made up. Other people said that Stan would like jump on desks, file cabinets to show the poses he wanted and the action, and you know, part of his, his legendary exuberance. Um, so the Mandarin wants to try to use the Hulk to attack the Red Chinese to spark World War Three. So the Mandarin can then take control in the aftermath, essentially. And Breslov and Fury t- team up, and they help defeat the Mandarin and, and spoil the scheme to launch a third world war. Uh, the next issue is actually Hulk special number one. Many listeners are probably familiar with this. The classic Steranko Severin cover of the Hulk on his shoulders lifting up the cover logo. You know the cover I'm talking about, right? I've, I have seen it, yes. yes. It's an absolute classic. Again, Jim Steranko didn't actually do – that many comics in the Marvel Silver Age, but the books he did, like the, the classic Nick Fury stories, of course, what he's most famous for, let it, left an indelible imprint because of his use of design, of uh, psychedelic imagery. Uh, you know, one of one of the great artists uh, in, in the history of the American comic book medium. In this story, the Black Bolt takes pity on the Hulk and offers him sanctuary, but the Hulk refuses, knowing the rest of the humans uh, fear him, and he, he leaps off. Do you want to add to this point? Anything, sir? Um, well, uh, this issue introduces some classic uh, inhuman supporting characters. It's like the, the minions of Maximus the Mad as uh, opponents for the Hulk. So the, the, the characters like Stalior, who was part Roman centurion and part horse. Uh, Timberius, Leonis, who was sort of lion-like in aspect. Uh, Oh, Falcona, who's bird-like. Yeah, uh, uh, Aereo, Nebulo, uh, or, or was it Nebula, Nebulos? Well, anyway, um, just, just, just sort of uh, criminally inclined in humans uh, who were uh, the followers of uh, the malcontent Maximus. I want to point out, ladies and gentlemen, merged all that without notes from his head. I just got a chill. It's, I, I must confess none of those names are written down on this piece of paper in front of me. <laughs> all right, 109 to 110 is a Kazar appearance. Kazar and Zebu. Zebu, right? I, I think it's Zabu. Zabu. Zabu, all right. The saber toothed tiger from the Savage Land. Mm-hmm. Um, they join the Hulk to battle off the living alien super weapon, the Galaxy Master. Yes, why don't you explain what the Galaxy Master is? Uh, well, he's a living alien super weapon. <laughs> He killed his creators, and now he's just sort of picking fights all throughout reality. Every time he finds an intelligent race that he perceives as a threat to himself, uh, he goes after it. Uh, he's enslaved one race called the Sagittarians, and so they, uh, they're they sort of working for him. Um, there, there's some kind of – some object or machine of importance to yeah. him hidden in the Savage Land. That's going to, I think, destroy the Earth's orbit or something like that? Something like yeah, that. It's, it's, it's a doomsday device of Yet. some kind. And uh, the uh, the Sagittarians send a super robot called Umbu the Unliving yes. to, f- to stave off the Hulk and, and Kazar. And then eventually the Galaxy Master shows up to take care of it himself. But uh, instead, it is he who is taken care of. Yes, and I remember issue one line. I love the cover. It's a classic um, Herb Trimpey art. Uh, maybe John Severin's inking. I'm not sure, but uh, – just Kazar standing on a, like a precipice, and you know they, they, they like eyes to rest. They incorporate the title into the artwork. It's it's a beautiful cover. Um, I'm skipping at issue 113, Murd, because that's where the Sandman appears in his funky green costume. What do you think of that costume? Ah, it's distinctive. Yes, uh, it is. It's, it's an inter- It's a nice change of pace yeah. uh, from the just basic it's a Kirby uh, design, green yeah. striped. Uh, a long sleeved shirt that he yeah. usually and tan pants that he normally wore. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it was uh, supposed to be a, a gift from uh, the wingless wizard because he was part of the frightful four, right? And yeah. it was equipped with a little alchemical attachments that enabled him to transform or transmute his sand into different yes. substances at will. And uh, he, in this story, he tries to steal a rocket to get, to reunite with his old ally Blastar, the living bomb burst mm-hmm. yeah. of the negative zone yeah. from the Fantastic because they they appeared together in the Fantastic Four, uh, not. Prior to this. So again, 
we have to remind people why readers love these stories, why Marvel was gaining such traction in the 60s because you felt like everything mattered. Everything was tied to everything else. It was, it was that – again, the sense of continuity, uh, which, which, which I think is one of the reasons why the movies are so successful now mm, because – Absolutely. I, I think for all the people who didn't experience the thrill of the Marvel Universe as it was a boring in the 60s, you're kind of getting that again now with these films. It's, it's the same spirit – uh, you know the same energy and humor and pathos and adventure, but just now on the big screen because now the special effects have caught up to the comics essentially. So, in some ways, I'm enjoying the movies now more than I'm enjoying the books. I almost feel like I'm at the beginning again of, of, of a, of a, of a, of a inter, inter, interlocked Marvel universe. <laughs> so you're like mighty Galactus, having survived the, uh, you know, the the prior Marvel universe. Now you're witnessing the birth of a new one. Oh, murder! And we get to devour it <laughs> together. I love this guy, ladies and gentlemen. Ah. All right, so issue 114, the Mandarin and the Sandman team up. It's kind of a strange team up, like the Mandarin with, you know, what's Sandman's real name again? Uh, well, he was called Flint Marco back then. Eventually, yeah. we learned that's an alias, and his real name is William Baker. Okay. I, I prefer Flint Marco, but. <laughs> it, it, it's more Stan Levian. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mandarin. A special dash to it. Yes, and Min- Mandarin's one of, like, you know, this brilliant criminal mastermind. I wouldn't say Flint Mark was a criminal mastermind. Nah, but so. he's used to working with brilliant criminal yes, masterminds. Yes, he is. Though. The wizard, for example. Yes. So the, sa- so the man is displeased with the same man's performance. So he knocks him into a chemical, which turns him into glass. <laughs> <laughs> Won't be the last time that happens no. to poor Flint either. And Betty convinces the Hulk to not harm the Sandman in his glass form. And then one of the things that can weaken the Hulk, we, this happened a couple times we haven't mentioned, is knockout gas mm. of some kind. So Talbot and Ross take the Hulk prisoner at this point. I should also point out around the same time – this is a classic issue, Captain America 110, uh, February 1969. This is Starenko's brief but legendary run on Cap, issues 110, 111, uh, maybe 113, something like that, where they're fighting Hydra and Rick Jones is trying to prevent the Hulk from going on a rampage in Manhattan and Cap shows up. And Stranko renders this very intimidating, imposing, incredible Hulk. And I remember this from my, one of my first Hulk stories I ever read in comic book. I remember Cap on his own trying to stop the Hulk, which he really couldn't do. But and the Hulk eventually wanders off. But the combat scenes are thrilling. And uh, Rick is injured by the Hulk in his rage. And this is where Cap takes Rick in, and Rick briefly becomes the Hulk's partner. Actually, excuse me, the Cap's party. He actually dons the, the Bucky costume. Yeah, and Cap doesn't know how he feels about it. And Cap's just like, why are you wearing that? Take it off, that type of thing. And they go on to fight you know, uh, Madame Hydra, later becoming Viper. And, right. and, and, and those, they're, they're, if you, if you want to read classic Marvel Silver Age, Jim Steranko, get those Cap stories. You've, see, you've, you've, you've seen the covers. They're, they're famous. And, and the first one is, is the Hulk bursting through a, like a brick facade uh, at, at Cap and uh, Rick. Anything you want to add there, my friend? Uh, not at this time. Thank All you. Right. Issue 115, Lo, the leader lives. All right, so the leader returns. And not one of his wisest decisions, General Ross accepts the leader's offer <laughs> to help contain the Hulk. Again, Ross consumed with his Ahab-like obsession with the Hulk because uh, he also knows this is Banner, who Betty loves. So he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna make some – Ross will make some very questionable decisions throughout his career as sort of a general – I mean and as a character in, in his quest to try to bring the Hulk down. So sure enough, the leader has nefarious ends here. And issue 116, he, tr- he, tr- he takes over Gamma Base. So he wants to launch this nuclear arsenal to, to spark World War III at the Soviet Union and then take – and then rule over the survivors of a post-apocalyptic Earth. <laughs> Lesson here, General, do not accept help from the leader. <laughs> so in issue 117, Betty convinces the Hulk she, she can reach the Hulk to revert to Banner. So Banner's intellect can stop the missile, and then the Hulk redirects the missile with his strength, and then the missile flies off uh, where it won't do no harm. And the Hulk is then flung into the sea where he then reverts to Bruce Banner. And in issue 118, this is the last issue in our checklist. That we're, now we're, we're going to 15-cent covers. We're on the cusp of the 1970s, what many people would consider the Bronze Age. And Banner's flown unconscious in the sea, and an Atlantean craft uh, emerges from, from beneath the waves, piloted by the Lady Dorma, who, of course, is the love of Namor the Submariner. Mm-hmm. 
and she takes pity on – and she's a blue-skin Atlantean. She takes pity on – she doesn't know who this is. She just – she takes him into her ship, brings him beneath the waves to, uh, of course, the undersea kingdom of Atlantis. She doesn't realize she's taken the Hulk into, you know, the bowels of the palace. And uh, Namor – now, I'd like to do a spotlight on Namor someday because he's such an important character in the history of the the American comic book and Bill Everett is creator. He needs to find his way into the movies soon. I I, I was thinking that too, Murd. Absolutely. That's actually – that's a glaring omission. That's a good point. Interesting additional fact. He's Alex Trebek's favorite superhero. Really? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if he's under the Fox – Banner because it's associated with the Fantastic Four. I don't know. Won't matter for much longer. That's true. Because that whole Disney Fox acquisition has uh, apparently gone through. That's true. So one of the one of the the, the uh, classic hallmarks of Namor's persona is that he has a temper. Shall we say? <laughs> we shall. And in this story, there's a rival for for his affections named Mistress Farah, who's a ne'er do well. Convinces Namor that Dorm has taken another man into the palace. So Namor starts to rage. Imagine saying this to your girlfriend or wife. Dorma, stand ye forth! And uh, he flings open the palace doors and he's raging. And, you know, his uh, faithful uh, Chamberlain, what's his name? Uh, Vashti, I think, is trying mm. to – won't listen to him. And Banner's turned into the Hulk and the Hulk can survive underwater, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Donnie Brook ensues. And it's it's classic Herb Trimpy art. They just battle – you know, hither and yon across Atlantis, you know, buildings are pulverized by the shock waves of their their fisticuffs, um, and eventually they they they're thrown onto the surface, and the Hulk is launched onto an island, and Namor swims after him to find out who he is. Then he, then he comes upon Bruce Banner lying, you know, helpless and and incapacitating, and, he, and the Namor realizes, oh, it's not the Hulk anymore. So he he goes back to the sea to, to repair the damage his temper tantrum has created. And uh, this issue, it, it's important to me because it's one of the first Hulk comics I read reprinted in Origin of Marvel Comics, issue 118. And it's one of my first experiences besides the power record of, of Herb Trippy's art, which I've always loved. For me, Herb Trippy, the way he draws machines, he was, he, he was a pilot in real life. He loved flying planes. He owned yeah. a biplane, actually. He would served in the Air Force in Vietnam. Actually, his job in Vietnam was to – he would uh, – he was actually in the, in the war zone. Uh, he wasn't flying or he wasn't in the, in the rear because he would have to – he would have to uh, – Prepare weather reports for the helicopter pilots and so forth. So he he was in Vietnam in the Central Highlands and so forth. So he brought that sensibility to his his work. Think of the Phantom Eagle, mm-hmm. the World War One pilot he created. Um, he would often bring his wondrous machines, technology, the way he would draw like GI Joe Transformers, and also into the Incredible Hulk. Anything you want to add to the checklist, my friend? Um, only one thing. Please, please. Uh, it's a Hulk appearance uh, from – it's from uh, well, another Marvel series. Mm-hmm. I mean you went, mentioned a while ago that the Avengers uh, would go Hulk hunting yes. once or twice during the, the Silver Age. Yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing us to a Amazing Spider-Man annual number three here, um, which is uh, Spider-Man's first attempt to join the Avengers. And as uh, the, his initiation test, the Avengers decide they're going to send uh, Spider-Man out on a Hulk hunt. Ah, uh, Yes. And so Spider-Man does indeed find the Hulk, and they, they the, the two of them have it out. But by the end of their battle, the Hulk uh, reverts to Bruce Banner. And uh, Spider-Man sees, oh, the Hulk's just a guy underneath all this. And he didn't know how much he trusted the Avengers yet at this point. He was afraid that if he brought this poor, vulnerable human, who sometimes through no fault of his own turned into a monster, to the Avengers, that uh, he'd be subjected to cruel experiments or something. So inst- he just kind of allows Bruce to go, and he goes back to the Avengers telling them, ah, sorry. I couldn't find the Hulk. I, I guess was it, I failed. What, what issue number was this? It's annual number three. Of Amazing Spider-Man? Yes. It's uh, uh, from 1966. Murd. Oh. It's bottom of the ninth. It's two outs. Bases are loaded. Full count. He just hits a grand slam, ladies and gentlemen. It's a walk-off. <laughs> <laughs> but no, th- and that, see, that's – again, that's why Marvel was special in these early years. It's a great example you've given because – Spider-Man's always the critical thinker, always a little suspicious of authority. Mm-hmm. And one and, of the most human characters yes. of a whole universe of very human characters yeah, that Marvel so has. That's, that's vintage Spidey. Well done. All right, I want to talk just briefly about other media. Um, right. So – and this brings – this takes us back to sort of the, the controversies with the way that Jack Kirby was created. Some listeners may be familiar with the, the Marvel mania concept of the late 60s where Marvel was getting involved – uh, in uh, other media like posters and so forth, T-shirts, 
And Kirby was commissioned in 69 to complete eight posters of some of the key Marvel characters. He did uh, Silver Surfer and Galactus. I had that one in my store, actually, a reprint of it, of course. Uh, the Fantastic Four, Doctor Doom, uh, Cap, Spider-Man, the Hulk. I'm forgetting one other. And the powers that be decided they didn't want them all to be just Kirby. So they had four of them redesigned. They, they didn't pay him for the four that he'd originally drawn. So th- these are all the, the, the key moments that just further sour Kirby about working with Marvel because as, as he, he's going to leave Marvel in 1970 and, and switch over to DC and create the new gods and so forth. So Herb Trimpey and her and Kirby didn't blame for this because Herb, Herb Trimpey was just an employee. He was ordered to redesign the Hulk poster. So if you see that poster, you can find it online. It's clearly a, a, a Kirby Hulk image, but the face, the head is the Herb Trimpey Hulk, mm-hmm. essentially. So Trimpey did a redesign of that poster. And, and as we mentioned at the beginning of our program, in 1966, Grant Ray Lawrence is commissioned to produce a series of Marvel cartoons. And as many listeners know, that all they did was they took art, you know, Kirby art, Don Heck art, Steve Ditko art, uh, Gene Colon art, and they would animate the mouths, maybe an arm or a leg. I mean, I'm... It's it's really stiff animation. The mighty gentlemen. two pose punch. Yes, <laughs> exactly. They have sound effects and, and music. I mean, I love them. The, to me, they're such a time capsule. Because um, basically, if you love the Silver Age, it's watching Silver Age comic panels. I don't know if come to life is is, is maybe that's giving it too much justice, but. Mm. They're given minor animation, essentially. And there's, there's overblown hyperbolic narration. And the, so the Hulk cartoon – and remember, you'll appreciate some of these names here. So the voice actor for Banner and Rick Jones was Paul Souls. Who's Paul Souls, Murd? Uh, well, in addition to being the voice of Spider-Man in yes. Grant Ray Lawrence's Spider-Man cartoon, he was the voice of uh, Hermie the Elf in the yes. classic Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer cartoon. I want to be a dentist. A dentist? Yeah. Oh, yes, and a couple of other names here I also recognize. So John Vernon, who played Dean Wormer in Animal House and the mayor in, in Dirty Harry, the original Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry film. And Tony Stark. He played he played Tony Stark in the cartoon. He played the Submariner. Uh, he played, and in the whole cartoon, he plays Glenn Talbot. Now, when I think of John Vernon, who was a fine actor, I mean, very, very deep, dignified voice, mm-hmm. you think of him in Animal House going... Every year, or you say every spring, the trees are – every fall, the trees are filled with toilet paper. (laughs) Every spring, the toilets explode. Who delivered the medical school cadavers to the alumni dinner? You're talking about Delta, sir. Of course I'm talking about Delta, you twerp. (laughs) Anyway, just fantastic. (laughs) Paul Kligman played – Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross. Yeah, also an um, alumnus of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He played uh, Donner, Rudolph's father, and also Clarice's father. So the uh, overbearing, pompous, thrissonical father figure. Is no daughter, daughter of mine will see a red-nosed reindeer! reindeer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you just picture Ross. No daughter of mine is seeing a jolly green giant! <laughs> Bravo, Murd. Max Ferguson played the Hulk. And the actress Vita Linder, who I believe was in one of the versions of Last of the Mohicans, played uh, Betty. So that's your cast for the very first Hulk cartoon. And there, there have been several Hulk cartoons. You've got the one in the 80s. Um, did he have a 90s cartoon? The Hulk, yo, yes, definitely. He did, right? It was so. on UPN on Sunday yeah, mornings, right. as I recall. Okay, which I never saw that one. I think I, I might have seen one or two episodes. I, I seem to recall Cree Summer was the voice of She-Hulk in the second season. Okay. Well, if, we, if we're able to fit in other Hulk spots on the road, we're going to return to all these. Oh, of course. Uh, but this, this, is, this is Hulk other media in the, in the Silver Age. So, and, of course, Marvel did Hulk T-shirts. I remember my wife Keiko many years ago bought me a reproduction of the Maurice Severn T-shirt where it says something like, Here comes the Incredible Hulk. And the back it goes, There goes the Incredible Hulk. And he's carrying like a little like <laughs> baby wagon behind him, which is you know, Maurice Severn's humor. So, Mary, anything to add before we uh, shoot our bolt here? Um, well, just one uh, look ahead to the future. Please. Um, it, if, if you can define the Hulk 
uh, by one well, – you, you, you can't. He's, he's too polysimus. But uh, <laughs> one constant – more than any other Marvel character, I would say, the, the only constant in the life of Bruce Banner and the Hulk is change, the perpetual oh, mutation. Yes. His status quo was ever-shifting. Now, even when a lot of the other Marvel characters were settling into more comfortable grooves or routines and selling just the illusion of change, yeah. uh, that never really happened to Bruce Banner or the Hulk. Mm-hmm. And even – and uh, Peter David uh, sort of took that as uh, – as, as his walking orders to see to it that the Hulk never settled on any one status quo for too long. So just uh, let, let's join us again in future Spotlight episodes to see what further gamma-powered mutations this poor man and his monstrous alter ego are put through by future creative teams. Here, here, As history marches on. All righty. Take us out there, brother. All right. Well, let us now remind everyone that this Spotlight episode of Comic Geek Speak was brought to you by Superhero Stuff, where you can go for all of your Superhero Stuff. stuff. Check them out at SuperheroStuff.com. And also by the Collection Drawer Company, maker of the Drawer Box Storage System. Revolutionize your collection today. It'll be much easier on your back, trust me, when you don't have to lift all those long boxes off each other. Go to CollectionDrawer.com to find out what they can do for you. If you'd like to send us an email, the address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. If you'd like to leave a voicemail, you can call 267-702-6642. You can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at comicgeekspeak. You can visit our forums at thecomicforums.vanillacommunity.com, where you can leave us feedback about uh, this episode and many other episodes of our podcast. Let us know what thoughts, reflections, and trivia you have to share about the Silver Age of the Hulk. Uh, And also, you can participate in discussions with your fellow Hello, CTS listeners, on a variety of geeky topics. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone who has uh, donated to the show, uh, either recently or in the distant past. We really appreciate it, and the show would not be what it is today without your help. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time.